In addition, when members are present in the proceeding via WebEx, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. And with that, we will turn to the topic of today's hearing, the President's proposed fiscal year 2023 budget with the Department of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means, Madam Secretary. We are honored by your presence. Since the last time you appeared before us, the U.S. economy has made substantial progress towards recovering from the once-in-a-lifetime, we hope, pandemic catastrophe. During the first months of the pandemic, so many businesses failed or cut back operations that unemployment hit levels this nation has not seen since the Great Depression. I would remind all that on March 11th of 2020, when Dr. Fauci offered his warning, which turned out to be accurate about what was coming, we saw 22 million Americans leave the workforce, an unemployment rate that exceeded 14 percent. It was a staggering blow, and none of us knew what a recovery might look like or how long it would take. Already, though, the economy is back at full employment. Unbelievable when you stop and think of it. Every job now that we lost has been returned. And as I noted this morning, 11 million American job opportunities still exist. There are almost two jobs per person that are available. Wages are rising. Consumer spending is robust. Fewer households are struggling under unmanageable debt burdens. And consumers have $2.3 trillion in additional savings compared with before the pandemic. While all of us on this committee are deeply concerned about rising inflation, and all of us worry about families struggling to keep up with mounting costs, there are parts of the economy that have recovered much more quickly than anticipated. As you recall, when President Biden took office a year and a half ago, we were in the depths of the COVID pandemic. The President worked with Congress to pass the American Rescue Plan, which quickly began to deploy vaccines, get workers back into the, their jobs, and support Americans with timely economic relief. Thanks to the American Rescue Package, we have recovered faster and stronger than other nations around the globe and averted what easily could have been a more serious crisis. The policies that this committee created, the expanded child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, and the child dependent care credit help sustain millions of low and middle income families. Families in every corner of this country had already been living paycheck to paycheck before the pandemic, and suddenly they faced now unemployment, reduced work hours and expenses they never could have anticipated. The stimulus payments, business relief measures, and other pandemic assistance kept millions of households and small businesses afloat. On behalf of my constituents, and I hear it every day from every corner of my district, from Republicans and Democrats, thanks what you did to get us through this difficult moment. But the Treasury Department employees were heroic as they pushed out life-saving economic relief during the crisis. Under unforeseeable, extraordinary hardship, the people of the Treasury Department managed to swiftly disperse stimulus payments, advance child tax credit monthly payments, and other relief measures that help millions of households and businesses survive. Your team, Madam Secretary, made a difference in the lives of the American people, and we appreciate your assertive leadership. At the same time, many of us on this committee would like to see a better resourced IRS to continue to promote greater fairness and equity in the administration and enforcement of tax laws. It simply is not fair that low-income families are audited at a much higher rate than high-income families, and the IRS must treat all taxpayers fairly and equitably. One of the many reasons I still hope to see progress on Build Back Better and the package that our committee advanced and that the House passed is the incorporation of long-overdue tax priorities. The bill not only makes our tax code more equitable by ensuring that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share, but it also supplies the IRS with the resources it needs to ensure that no taxpayer is above the law. This legislation would also tackle the existential threat of climate change, bring down energy costs for working families, bolster our energy independence, and loosen the grip of oil companies on our economy. While Americans are experiencing pain at the pump, oil companies have clearly benefited in an unprecedented fashion. Their profits in the first quarter of this year were 300 percent above the same time last year. During the first quarter of this year, their profits were raked in by the largest oil companies, amounting to more than 28 percent 
of the amount that Americans spent on gasoline. Across the economy, families are getting pushed to the brink in order to line the pockets of people who already were doing quite well. Build Back Better will help to insulate our economy from some of this con conduct. We have been fortunate to have had you as a strong partner, Madam Secretary, in crafting a thoughtful package, and I look forward to working with you to push these important issues across the finish line. Finally, on a personal note, I want to thank you for your leadership at international tax negotiations. I was a full partner to you on that and, and helped, I think, influence the decision of some of our international allies. Finding agreement among 218 members of Congress is always difficult. I imagine you experienced a similar challenge in reaching an agreement with 130 countries. I'm hopeful that meaningful progress on implementing Pillar 2 will be achieved in the EU and our other partner countries in coming weeks. We all understand that in international tax, the devil's in the details. So I'm also looking forward to working with you and providing feedback on issues important to our caucus as you continue these efforts and with our partners on the other side and partner countries to move forward with implementation. I look forward to your continuing work to set a course for our economy so that our nation might thrive. With that, now let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, for the purpose of an opening <coughs> statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Yellen, welcome back to the committee. It is good to have you here. As you know, I have tremendous respect for you and the Treasury Department. But as you know, I strongly disagree with the failed economic policies of this administration. President Biden clearly bungled the economic recovery. And as a result, working families and Main Street businesses are paying a steep price. Americans are being hammered with the shrinking economy, shrinking paychecks, slower job growth, and record pessimism about the future. A new report shows 83% of Americans rate President Biden's economic leadership as poor. Taking office armed with every economic advantage, President Biden has posted a terrible record. He's missed expectations in four of his five quarterly economic reports. And last quarter, the economy actually shrank. He's fallen short in half the monthly jobs reports, creating a mere 8.6 million jobs. President Trump, by contrast, created 12.5 million jobs during the months after the pandemic, averaging 1.4 million jobs a month, even without life-saving vaccines and a nearly nationwide lockdown. President Biden has never come close. Due to the administration's dismissal and subsequent denial of inflation and the worker crisis, plus massive deficit spending that fueled 40-year high inflation, American families and Main Street businesses are suffering from higher prices on nearly everything. Make no mistake, the administration should have known Inflation doubled in just two months before the American Rescue Plan, way over the 2% rate the Federal Reserve targets. Yet this administration, and you, as one of its most respected cabinet secretaries, repeatedly urged Congress to act now, act big. In assured America, in your words, I don't believe the American Rescue Plan will be inflationary. You couldn't have been more wrong. And now we face a looming economic recession and high inflation for perhaps years. And as a result, life is brutally harder for families and small businesses. Month after month, prices outpace paychecks, slashing real wages by over 3%, costing the typical family an extra $5,000 this year. Experts predict we'll hit $6 a gallon by August, with average families spending an extra $2,000 on gas alone. It's no wonder three in four Americans believe we'll be in a recession within the year. And it's not just workers and families who've lost faith in the president's competence. Double-digit inflation is hitting small businesses and has for months. Most small businesses say they've been forced to pass higher costs on to their consumers. And more than 60% of them fear that Biden inflation will drive them out of business entirely. But these aren't the only crises. For the past year, Treasury has ignored the tax refund crisis with an unconscionable total of 26 million returns backlogged at the IRS. Americans hit hard with inflation can't even get their own refunds back to help keep their family budgets afloat. Money's not the problem. Congress gave the IRS over $1.8 billion in emergency funding. Instead of using it to work off the backlog, Treasury instead focused on pushing a dangerous bank surveillance scheme that would target the privacy of families, small businesses, and farmers, and funding to unleash 80,000 new IRS agents on American taxpayers, including low- and moderate-income families. While other nations are lowering their business taxes to fight inflation, President Biden is proposing $4 trillion 
in crippling tax hikes on Main Street businesses and their workers. It will drive prices even higher, along with tax hikes on American investors that will rob crucial funding for investment to address the crippling supply chain crisis. It's an economic surrender, both here at home and with our foreign competitors. So, too, is the current OECD agreement on global minimum taxes and digital services taxes. Congress will not ratify an agreement that makes America less competitive, surrenders precious U.S. tax revenues to foreign governments by allowing them to target American businesses, or turns the sovereignty over the U.S. tax code from Congress to the OECD and foreign accounting associations. But that is exactly what the current agreement does. Today also marks one year since ProPublica first published illegally disclosed taxpayer information. They're using the data for a politically motivated agenda and claim to have a vast trove of years and years of confidential taxpayer information. Yet neither Congress nor the public has gotten any answers from Treasury on how this private data was leaked. To date, neither Treasury nor Justice has even confirmed they've acquired the data that was stolen. If you don't know what was stolen, how can you conduct a credible investigation? We have been patient, but when are we going to get some answers? Treasury has found time, though, to launch a frivolous and politically motivated investigation against Texas for its legitimate use of COVID relief dollars to address the health and humanitarian impacts of the dangerous open borders policy, including overcrowding of federal detention shelters, dangerous COVID-19 health conditions, keeping frontline health savers, a health worker safe, curbing sex and drug trafficking, including record high fentanyl smuggling and preventing migrant deaths. Sadly, 700 migrants have died on American soil under President Biden, the highest on record. The bottom line is working Americans are hurt hardest by these crippling crises. The question is when are they going to see relief? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Now it's my pleasure to turn to our esteemed witness, the United States Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Madam Secretary, your statement will be made part of the record in its entirety. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help you with that time, please keep an eye on the timer that's in front of you. I will notify you when the time has expired. Madam Secretary. Thank you. Chair Neal, Ranking Member Brady, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the administration's budget proposals. This budget prioritizes essential investments in education, medical care, and affordable housing, alongside tax reforms that enable deficit reduction and prioritize a fairer tax system. Over the past year and a half, we have experienced a robust recovery characterized by strong economic growth, historically low unemployment, and high household savings rates. This rapid, broad-based recovery has been buttressed by the congressional response to the challenges of the pandemic, beginning with the CARES Act at the beginning of the pandemic, continuing with the Consolidated Appropriations Act in late 2020, and the American Rescue Plan legislated at the beginning of 2021. As President Biden said last week, we're now entering a period of transition from one of historic recovery to one that can be marked by stable and steady growth. Making this shift is a central piece of the President's plan to get inflation under control without sacrificing the economic gains we've made. We've also managed to avert the far worse outcomes that were forecast at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. After the onset of the pandemic, CBO forecast that the unemployment rate would exceed 9% in 2021. Now we're experiencing historically low unemployment. We're also witnessing sharp reductions in the budget deficit, with CBO recently forecasting the largest nominal reduction to the federal deficit in history. According to their projections, the deficit as a share of the economy this year will be at a lower level than CBO projected before the American Rescue Plan passed. Still, we're currently facing macroeconomic challenges, including unacceptable levels of inflation, as well as the headwinds associated with the disruptions caused by the pandemic's effect on supply chains and the effect of supply-side disturbances 
to oil and food markets, resulting from Russia's war in Ukraine, to dampen inflationary pressures without undermining the strength of the labor market, an appropriate budgetary stance is needed to complement monetary policy actions by the Federal Reserve. Moving forward, elements of the President's proposed legislation, including the clean energy initiatives and plans to reform the prescription drug market, can help lower the cost paid by the American consumers. Treasury has been actively working with Congress on many challenges. Most important is our joint response to Russia's illegal, unprovoked war against Ukraine. Treasury is committed to doing what we can to ensure that Putin's brutal war continues to be met with fierce resistance internationally. Alongside more than 30 other partners abroad, accounting for more than half the world's economy, the U.S. government has imposed unprecedented financial pressure measures on Russia and its leadership. Today, the Kremlin has been cut off from the global financial system. The Russian economy is experiencing severe contraction, with most analysts projecting a double-digit decline in Russian GDP in 2022, and they're experiencing sharply elevated inflation. We're grateful for the strong support of Congress in this endeavor, including its recent provision of $40 billion in security, economic, and humanitarian aid to the people of Ukraine. Our joint resolve is essential to supporting the people of Ukraine against this brutal invasion of their homeland. Over the past year and a half, we have successfully collaborated with Congress on the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, a bill designed to do the hard generational work of building a more dynamic, structurally sound economy by smartly investing in the future. This law will rebuild America's roads, bridges, and rails, expand access to clean drinking water, ensure every American has access to high-speed internet, and invest in communities that have too often been left behind. But our work isn't done. Building a fair and stable tax system that promotes broadly shared growth is important to both adequately funding investments and to reducing deficits and debt. I look forward to working with Congress to ensure that we continue to make progress in this regard. In the administration's fiscal 23 budget, we suggest smart, fiscally responsible investments, cutting deficits and keeping the economic burden of debt low. The budget's investments are more than fully paid for through tax code reforms requiring corporations on the wealthiest, individual, wealthiest Americans to pay their fair share, closing loopholes and improving tax administration. Finally, it's no secret that I'm keenly focused on moving forward on the global agreement on international tax reform, including a global minimum tax that will level the playing field and raise crucial revenues to benefit people around the world. Last fall, 137 countries, representing nearly 95% of the world's GDP, agreed on a deal that will stabilize our tax systems, provide resources to invest in security, and respond to crises like COVID-19, and ensure corporations fairly share the burden of financing government. I am hopeful that Congress will also implement this global minimum tax as part of its legislative agenda. Thank you. I look forward to taking Thank you, it. Madam Secretary. Without objection, each member will be recognized for three and a half minutes to accommodate the Treasury Secretary's time. They will be allowed to question witnesses, as always. We want to ensure that all members have an opportunity before she's required to leave. Consistent with committee practice in these remote settings, we will dispense with the Gibbons rule, and we will go in order of seniority, switching between majority and minority members let me begin by recognizing myself. Uh, Madam Secretary, the administration has been focused on $80 billion of funding for the IRS. Why is this a significant multi-year investment to be that important? And what will be a better resourced IRS mean for all taxpayers? Well, in part, Chair Neal, this is a proposal 
about enforcing our tax laws. It's unjust that ordinary wage earners are compliant with their tax returns, yet for high earners who accrue income at no opaque ways, tax compliance in effect is voluntary, and this proposal will address it. But more than that, it's a proposal about improving the experience of all taxpayers as they interact with the IRS, making sure that customer service representatives are available to answer the phones when they call with questions, and that they also get access to tax credits, refunds, and other benefits when they're entitled to. It'll provide resources to hire more employees, and that's critical to addressing this issue and ensuring that the IRS has the workforce and the technologies it needs to best serve taxpayers. You know that the tax gap annually is estimated at $600 billion, and closing that gap is really critical to ensuring fiscal responsibility. We need to invest in the IRS to do that. Thank you. And Madam Secretary, the American Rescue Plan's expansion of advanced premium tax credits has been certainly vital to ensuring the safety and economic well-being of all members of the American family. Millions were able to enroll in a quality plan for $10 or less per month, and families saved an average of about $2,400 a year on their insurance premiums. Absent action, we will see more uninsured and higher health care premiums. While Congress works to develop legislation that will include deficit reduction, an enormous step towards fighting inflation certainly would be that you would agree to extending those uh, credits that I've just described. It's one of the key steps that we can take to protect consumers from rising costs. I believe the American Rescue Plan's expanded uh, tax credit um, really made a huge difference in the lives of working uh, families, and extending it um, would mean that the help that they've received over the last two years would continue to be available. It would put more money in their pockets to address everyday needs rather than health insurance. Um, it's resulted in a large expansion of coverage and lowered costs and believe it should be extended. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, to inquire. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am very concerned, Madam Secretary, that in your global tax negotiations, Treasury is surrendering the U.S. tax base to foreign governments, a tax base we'll need in the future to fund important government services. I, they do this, or your agreement does this, by targeting 60 percent of the revenues for redistribution will come from U.S. companies. I don't understand why you signed an agreement that targets Boeing but not Airbus, the targets Caterpillar and John Deere, but not their foreign competitors, Volvo or Korematsu. So my question is, given the fact that our U.S. tax base is for our U.S. taxpayers, will you commit to walk away from any deal on Pillar 1 or Pillar 2 that results in lower tax revenues for the United States? Well, on Pillar 1, which I think that you were mainly referring to in your remarks. Um, the proposal is to subject a portion of the profits of all large multinationals and highly profitable multinationals wherever they're based to share um, globally a portion um, of those taxing rights. And the United States, um, as a large market economy, um, will gain the ability to tax a portion of the excess profits of foreign companies. We have not yet been able to come to provide an estimate of exactly what the net gain or loss is because there are critical details sure. of Pillar 1 that and remain Madam Secretary, to be negotiated. No, no, I understand but, you're in those negotiations, um, but I think you'll admit the majority of those tax revenues will come from U.S. businesses in the U.S. tax base. And well, secondly, I, I, I would love to see, I know we've requested it several times, will you share this week with Congress Treasury's economic analysis of this agreement, specifically the redistribution in Pillar 1? And as I've read, the Pillar 2 design will also result 
in gaming over the U.S. tax code for redistribution. So could you share those economic impacts with the tax writers well, in as, Congress? As, as I said, um, until some f final details of Pillar 1 are negotiated, it's not a, we're not possible to come up with an estimate to share with a committee. But um, our calculations do show that the impact is likely to be small, no. either if, way, I hope, positive or yeah. negative. Thank you. I hope and that's the case, I, but, I, also, but I do I ask that you share that. But I do have a final question. I know your time is so incredibly busy. So under your global tax plan, you propose Congress give up its taxing authority to foreign, foreign governments, the OECD, and the accountants at the Financial Accounting and the International Accounting Standard Board. These aren't just tax uh, provisions on international ta uh, tax, but on research and development, on, on expensing, on uh, local tax um, credits and how they're designed. So how do you convince House tax writers, whose authority is anchored in the Constitution, to cede that authority over our own tax code to foreign governments or to unelected accounting bureaucracies? Well, I guess I would disagree with the characterization that we're ceding our rights to tax income to foreigners, but the agreement does contain an enforcement mechanism in which countries that do not adopt uh, a compliant global minimum tax, that other countries do have uh, the right to ensure Unf that unfortunately, Madam multinationals Chairman, pay a minimum I, tax. I get it. I, I strongly disagree. and I've read both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, and, and you are not protecting either the U.S. tax code or the way we do our tax credits. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, is recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. As the chairman has indicated, uh, your leadership uh, in trying to prevent the global race to the bottom from those who would dodge their taxes uh, is so very important. Uh, we know here that after agreeing to uh, the global minimum tax agreement, Poland has come up with uh, last-minute objections either for themselves or on behalf of someone that doesn't want to pay their taxes. Uh, why is it in the interest of America that we lead instead of follow, that we go first regardless of what the polls say or what the European Union does? This is um, an agreement that is very much in the U.S. national interest. Um, it will um, enable us to um, reduce some of the burden of taxation that currently falls on workers and place it on corporations whose contributions relative to our size of our economy has diminished strongly over time. And the agreement contains strong protections. Once we adopt it, um, we can place sanctions on countries that don't go along with it. But I'm very encouraged that most major economies are moving forward in adopting it. Um, the, the European Union, I believe, will adopt it soon. Um, we've talked with Poland, and I'm very hopeful that Poland will soon decide uh, that it's in their interest to agree to this. I've tried to explain uh, to their senior leadership that it is um, not only in the U.S. interest, but also in Poland's interest to um, reduce the prevalence of tax shelters around around the world, and it will help them compete better. Um, Ireland, that was initially um, reticent to join, has come to that perspective. I think the same applies to Poland. Well, and for the United States, this will level the playing field. We're the only country in the world that currently has a minimum tax that we impose on the foreign income of our multinationals. We propose raising it, and the agreement would raise it somewhat, but our competitors have no such tax, and they will move from zero to 15%. And that means that we will be leveling the playing field on behalf of U.S. So companies. not only does uh, this global minimum tax uh, end some of the distortion in the current tax system that favors uh, those who dodge their taxes versus those domestic businesses that are paying their taxes, not only does it benefit us in not having an incentive to export American jobs, but you're saying that it actually helps many multinationals uh, because of the way their international competitors will be taxed. 
as to pillar one which is not even yet the negotiations are not even complete as you were telling mr brady uh... it's not a matter of just comparing uh... the tax that you're working on getting an agreement with doing nothing if we do nothing want many of our technology companies be exposed to multiple digital service taxes in other countries and isn't it to their advantage which i think most of them have recognized to get an agreement on pillar one they do recognize that they see that there is a global proliferation of digital service taxes and other uh, source-based taxes and this will bring pillar one will bring an end to that and provide them with an environment of tax certainty and i believe most are in favor of our moving forward with this. Thank you for your leadership. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to inquire. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I want to say I want to thank you for your service. Uh, you and I just talked briefly a few minutes ago, but my passion is really the look at the big picture in terms of debt and deficits. If you look over the last 15 years, everybody talks about reducing the deficits and that we've ran up almost $20 trillion in debt in the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. So one of my, that's, we, what can we do about that? But also I want to just, how does that tie in, in your opinion, to inflation? In the last four or five years, or last couple of years, we ran into four or five trillion dollars of additional spending. They like to spend another two trillion, but everybody feels in our area that it's impacting inflation in a big year, and it's killing a lot. I'm in Florida, so a lot of our seniors uh, count on a slight raise here and there, and this deficit is really hurting them badly. So what's your thought between spending and inflation? It seems like there's a connection. Well, so spending has come down. Government spending and the deficit have come down dramatically. We had a substantial response to the pandemic, which was appropriate. It succeeded in getting our economy back to full employment and mitigating a great deal of harm in that way. I think it was very successful. But there's no question that inflation is unacceptably high and we need to get it down. Yeah. And it's partly a matter of demand and supply. And the Federal Reserve has a primary responsibility. Madam Secretary, we're just short on time. Let me ask I, you just quickly in terms of interest rates rising, it's impacting a lot, of, a lot of people in the 70s, you know, we had inflation. We had, we used that as a, I think our major tool to try to tap down inflation. But as you raise interest now, 50 basis points or 100 basis, you're probably talking $300 billion in additional taxes. Uh, it doesn't seem like we can continue to raise rates because of the massive deficits and the debt that we have. What's your thoughts on that? Well, um, interest rates at the beginning of the pandemic were exceptionally low to try to help the economy recover. And that resulted in a, really a negative burden of the debt on the U.S. economy. Um, I, I think the most important measure of the burden of the debt on the U.S. is the real net interest that we have to pay. Let me just, let me just add, Madam Secretary. And we always projected that interest rates would rise. Yeah, let me so they are rising. They're rising back to more normal levels. The interest burden of the debt remains completely Let me ask one more quick question. If you look years. at 7 or 8 percent or 10 percent, you could be looking at $3 trillion in interest, uh, which we only take in. We only take in $4 trillion roughly. Uh, so I'm very, very concerned about in terms of interest rates, you know, how long this can go on and how much we can afford. But really, 100 basis points, like I said, you're talking about $300 uh, billion in additional taxes from the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, let me uh, join uh, in acknowledging the unbelievable job that you did in leveling the playing field internationally. And this comes at a time internationally that we haven't seen uh, with the uh, COVID global epidemic and, of course, with uh, in the aftermath of uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, et cetera, has placed uh, incredible outside forces that have uh, impacted 
uh, our economy, and certainly inflation as well. Uh, yet, on the other side, uh, we're told that uh, uh, Senator Scott has uh, proposed uh, that uh, we sunset both uh, Medicare and Social Security. Uh, hard to believe that during this time of inflation that that would be the plan. Now, Mitch McConnell has been at least more straightforward. He said, we have no plan. We have no plan. Uh, we have no agenda currently that we're going to talk about. We're not going to come up with any solutions. We're going to continue to go after the administration. And if you want to know our plan, we'll tell you after we're elected. Now, that's not a plan from my perspective, and hopefully the American people as we go forward pick up on that. But the other thing this committee has done, and we referred to this uh, in your remarks, both with the Affordable Care Act and what that was able to provide with families for relief. Uh, uh, Mr. Yardgood from my district was paying $1,400 a month and now is paying $200 a month. Enormous savings. Ms. Delbeni here was the author of our child tax credit. So the combination of the Affordable Care Act, the child tax credit, and oh, by the way, making sure that Medicare and Social Security are there for our citizens, the group that is most impacted by inflation. What is your opinion on what we should continue to do with, in those areas? So, I agree very strongly with the comments that you just made about the importance of all of these programs. Of course, Medicare and Social Security that are the foundations of a secure retirement and that every American uh, depends on uh, to feel that they can have a what reasonable retirement. What message does sunsetting the two most critical programs for American seniors, the people most impacted by the pandemic and the people most impacted by inflation because they're on fixed income? Well, you know, we inflation does, particularly energy and food prices, impact working families very hard. And I think what we can do, what Congress can do, is to look for other ways to make household budgets work and the child tax credit has played a very important role. It reduced child poverty by 50% and gave families um, the breathing room they need to be able to feed and clothe their children and buy them um, school supplies. And the ACA credits, as you said, greatly reduced the expense that families had to pay um, for, health, for health insurance. And these are really important ways President Biden believes what we can do to address inflation, what the government can do. The Fed has to be left to do its job, but we should be looking for ways to mitigate expenses that American households pay for some of the most burdensome items like health care and um, supporting children and taking care of them. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for your uh, appearance here today. It's, it's timely given the challenges that our economy is facing right now. I have a, a number of, of concerns about uh, what I think most Americans would consider a, a mismanagement of our economy. I know that uh, President Biden and the administration seem to be doing woefully little to address the fundamental challenges that Americans are facing. Inflation uh, is said to be over 8 percent. Food inflation, over 10 percent. I think a lot of Americans would even say that it's worse than that. At least that's what they feel. And, you know, uh, wages are up maybe 5 percent, but that's uh, overshadowed certainly by, by inflation. And in the context, you know, I, I think uh, the president, you know, he, he's bragging about the unemployment rate, and yet the workforce participation rate uh, would show that we've got some work to do. And, and that's certainly concerning, and I'm, I'm proud of Nebraska's uh, lowest unemployment rate uh, since it's been recorded across the country. And, uh, but I, I'm very concerned that the messages that we're hearing are that uh, the policies that got us into this situation are, are going to be continued. Uh, that, that is uh, a huge concern that I have. But let me more specifically say that uh, I, along with 50 other members, including every Republican on this committee, 
sent a letter to you opposing the windfall taxes, the so-called windfall taxes on domestic energy production. The response we received essentially said that we will implement this tax if Congress enacts it. That, that is true, uh, but uh, didn't take a position. So just uh, very, very uh, directly, a yes or no, does President Biden support the so-called windfall tax on domestic energy production? Our focus when it comes to energy production is um, to make sure that there are adequate incentives and high prices are such an incentive for American oil. So is that is that a, a yes or no gas. in terms of this this proposed tax? We have, we have not taken a position um, in support of the, of this proposal. Okay, very briefly then, in the interest of time, a yes or no a response to this question as well. Uh, at a re on a recent panel, a Cecilia. Rouse, uh, chairman, or chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, said, and I quote, most household balance sheets are strong and can provide some cushion for rising prices. Yes or no? Do you, would you agree with that statement? Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, previously, uh, you had expressed that inflation was too low, and uh, you responded by uh, repeating uh, that uh, inflation was too low and that you felt interest rates were also too low. Uh, do you still think that low inflation we saw prior to the pandemic was a bad thing? I think 2% is, um, which is the Fed's long-run average inflation target, is an appropriate target. And as we've seen in Japan, excessively low inflation can hobble the conduct of monetary policy and create deflationary pressures, which um, are not healthy for an economy. Okay. Uh, after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted, the U.S. had wage growth of approximately 3.5 percent and inflation around 2 percent. And as I said, as I've said before, we currently have 8 percent inflation and 5 percent wage growth. A yes or no, would you believe that 8 percent inflation with 5 percent wage growth is better for working families? 8 percent inflation is an unacceptable inflation rate in the United States, and it's President Biden's number one objective to get that down. There are many reasons for it, and Russia's war on Ukraine is an important part of it. We are by far not the only economy uh, to face inflationary pressures like this. The UK has inflation close to 9%. Uh, Germany has- I, I understand that, I understand that. And in, in the interest of time, I, I just want to close by saying that you know, the American people, folks on Main Street, folks in our districts, uh, I think would have a very different perspective uh, on the economy than that which we see uh, coming from the administration. And I realize the president wants to be proud of his agenda, uh, but the fact of the matter is we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for being here with us. And let me just say how much I admire the work that you've done. I don't think any Treasury Secretary, with the possible exception of Lincoln's Secretary Chase, has faced the challenges that have confronted you. A pandemic, a war, uh, let us say a, a complete collapse of sort of a partisan uh, spirit of cooperation. We even found that the infrastructure bill crafted by largely by Senate Republicans turned into an attack even against some uh, few Republicans who vote for it. This is unprecedented. Now, I have some questions that I would like to work with your staff to try and uh, elaborate on in terms of uh, our Competes Act, some of the things that we've done there under the trade title, uh, work in making sure that cannabis businesses have access to banking services and are not sitting ducks for robbery, uh, and of course, looking at the important elements that we've done with climate uh, in our uh, pro proposals for energy moving forward. And so I'd like to work with your staff on that a little bit. But I would like to yield the balance of my time to you because I find it's sort of Alice in Wonderland. We heard the ranking member somehow attacking uh, the, pr the shortcomings of the IRS after over a decade of deliberate attacks by the Republicans on its budget and its credibility. Now, I would like you to, if you would, just maybe elaborate on one Point. Somehow, the ranking member thinks that the important work you've done in 
international taxation is somehow going to surrender our ability to be able to protect American businesses. As we know, a lot of them are not paying uh, any significant amount of tax at all. Would you elaborate on that? Yes, I, I think that the international agreement that we have achieved is very important and what it's going to do is stop a global race to the bottom in corporate tax rates that have been going on um, around the globe for decades. If you look at the major economies and look at their corporate tax rates, they've just been falling and falling. As one country cuts taxes, others feel they have to compete and go along. And who are the winners from this? The winners are the corporations and the losers are workers in the United States and the rest of the world who end up bearing an unfair share of total taxation we need to support all the spending and investments that are necessary to make our economy productive and to grow. And um, what this global agreement does is it has all the, all the governments around the world joining hands and say, saying, saying, let's band together and stop this and create a system where corporations do contribute to um, providing the revenue that all governments need to support their spending in a way that's fair. And the United States gains um, a great deal from this agreement. Um, our corporations will find an improved uh, competitive situation. We're the only country in the entire world that um, taxes the foreign earnings of multinational corporations. No other country does that. And every country has agreed that they will establish a, a rate of at least 15%. And the agreement has a very strong enforcement mechanism. If some tax haven says, what the heck, I signed on to this agreement, but I'm not going to do it, we have a way, every country that signs on to it has a way to penalize that that country, and they will quickly find it is in their interest to put in place the tax, um, the tax they've agreed to. So our, our companies will gain because right now they face an unlevel playing field, and this will level the playing field. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. To Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Secretary Yellen, thanks for being here. I watched a little bit of your time spent with the Senate yesterday, so this can't always be pleasant for you. Um, I want to read something, though, because I think what we're missing here from time to time is the fact that we talk in Washingtonese, and then when I go back home in Pennsylvania, there's a complete dis disconnect from what it is that's happening as opposed to what we say is happening down here. So Charles Dickens writes a book called The Tale of Two Cities, and it starts off, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, but we had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven, or we were all going directly the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted upon being received for good or for evil. Uh, the reason I bring that up, when I listen to this administration about how good things are, about how fabulous we're doing, about how we've survived all of this COVID stuff because we have the ability to outspend everybody else in the world. So in essence, what you're telling us today is we are the sickest people in the, in the sick ward. I just don't understand how we could become so disconnected. The average family in my district makes $54,000 a year. We subsidize somebody to buy an electric vehicle. We'll give them 7,500 bucks funded by taxpayers and we'll talk to the guy or gal who's making $54,000 a year and say, but you guys get no help. You get no help. Now, this idea about inflation, and somehow we talk that it's, it's, it's gonna go away. Uh, somehow we have it under control. So I think the real truth of everything is what is the perception of everyday Americans that when they wake up in the morning, what they face, what they are looking at in their future, how they're going to make, uh, make their children's future a little bit better. When seven 
ten, seven out of ten Americans believe we are going in the wrong direction? Don't you think it's time for this administration to say we need to make a course correction? Isn't it, isn't it time for that to happen? I, know, I, I don't know that you can respond today. We're giving you three and a half minutes for us to ask a question and you to answer it. And I don't think that's possible. I don't think that's possible. We talk about kitchen table economics. We talk about that all the time. So our revenue is going to be something like uh, over $5 billion or $5 trillion revenue. We're going to spend, though, $6.8 trillion. If you reduce it down to kitchen table economics, that tells somebody who's making $51,000 a year, it's okay to spend $68,000. That's the number they understand. It's not all the hyperbole and all the things about this is the way it's going, and believe me, if you just follow this course, you're going to be all right. This is a freaking disaster. And I know that you're with the administration, so you have to follow a certain uh, talking points. I get that. I don't understand how the smartest people in the world sitting in this administration can tell us everything's okay. Just yes. hold your breath, and we're going to keep you underwater for a while, but you hold your breath long enough, and when you finally surface, maybe there'll be a reason for you. I'm not asking you to answer a question. I'm really not, because I don't think you can in three and a half minutes tell us. First of all, I can't ask a question in three and a half minutes like this. That's just <laughs> but, but the reason I'll I ask it that way is because of the people I represent. Please, let's start looking at the real Americans, those people that make $54,000 a year and what they're facing when their gasoline prices have gone through the ceiling. One thing we don't talk about is propane, and people joke about it. Said, we only use that in our summer grill. No, in Pennsylvania, in the district that I represent, we use that to heat our homes during the winter. It went up over 50% this year, so please. If you would take that message back to the administration as you all sit around at the tables, talk about how it's affecting real Americans in real ways every single day. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kine, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Secretary, welcome. I will try to get to a question, but first an acknowledgement. It's unquestionable that you and President Biden inherited an unprecedented situation when you came into office with a global pandemic that was crippling the global economy. It shut down consumer demand. It disrupted supply chains. It was a god-awful mess. And yet, since that time, we've had a historic reduction of the unemployment rate, uh, real wages increasing across virtually every sector. The administration has presided over well over 400,000 jobs per month being created. Even annual budget deficits now have turned a quarter after the extraordinary measures that had to be taken to, to shore up the tattered economy. Even our trade deficit saw a decline due to the strength of exports that we uh, uh, just witnessed in the last month. So there was a lot of good things happening in that, but we still have that persistent problem of inflation. Now, the other side would have us believe that there were certain policies being pursued by the administration that's the sole cause of inflation, but the last time I checked, this is globally based. And let me give you just a minute for you to uh, explain what you see driving this global inflationary phenomenon that doesn't just make it unique to the United States. Many countries in the EU, Great Britain, for instance, are looking at even higher inflationary pressures than we are today. I, I agree. Um, almost all developed countries are seeing higher inflation. The UK just posted close to 9%, uh, Germany 8%, the Eurozone 7 our neighbor to the north, Canada uh, 7 So this is not just something that um, we're experiencing. And of course, an important part of it is higher energy and food prices. Um, energy prices, oil prices plunge um, when the economy weakened, and initially part of the increase was them rebounding toward more normal levels, but more recent and oil production in the United States declined. Then Russia launched its war on Ukraine, driving up global energy prices all around the world, and this had a huge impact on the supply of food. Wheat, corn prices are way up, um, oil, cooking oils, um, and this is something that is an enormous burden both in the United States and all around the globe, particularly in the emerging markets in poor countries that are um, look to Ukraine and Russia for wheat supply. So this is definitely a global phenomenon. 
it uh, countries with very different fiscal yeah. policies. Let me ask you this. The other side would have us believe that under the American Rescue Plan, rebate checks have been a big contributor to driving consumer demand. But is there any real policy, fiscal policy differentiation between affecting consumer de demand between rebate checks sent to most Americans versus tax cuts that would be sent to most Americans? Well, tax cuts that are s sent to most Americans can also stimulate spending. Um, it, that certainly can have that impact. So um, it's essentially the same, the same thing. And put me in the category of encouraging the administration to take a harder look at the 301 tariffs and the impact that's having on the cost shifting on American businesses, the American consumers. It is a hidden tax that was applied by the previous administration. I really don't see any strategic value that we're gaining from maintaining it, and I know you're doing that review right now. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, it is a pleasure to finally have you before our committee. I know we have a short period of time, so I'll just get into the questions real quick. Do you uh, see any role for fiscal restraint in combating inflation? I do. Um, we, our budget proposes deficit reduction. Deficits have come down, but especially in light of the inflationary situation, so, um, I think there should be further deficit reduction. So fiscal restraint does affect inflation. I yes, appreciate that. You said yes. yes. Um, the deficit last year, what was it? Um, was it $2.78 trillion? Probably. I yeah, that's, that's what we have from the Budget Committee. And that is the second largest deficit in the history of this nation. So when you have the second largest deficit in the history of our nation, the year following surely is going to be a deficit reduction. I will also point out that the deficit that was brought forward last year was $517 billion more than what the Congressional Budget Office said it would be prior to passage of the $2 trillion American Rescue Plan. Would you agree with that? I'm not sure I understood quite quite the numbers you gave, but certainly the rescue plan did. The deficit last year ended up to be $517 billion more than what the Congressional Budget Office informed us would be prior to passage of the $2 trillion American Rescue Plan. We had numerous economists, especially Democrat econ economists that worked for President Obama, that said that if you would pass that $2 trillion American Rescue Plan, we would see the highest inflation in a generation. And in fact, we have. We've seen the highest inflation in my lifetime. The last time we've seen inflation this high was when I was born. And so most Americans are definitely facing that. Since Joe Biden took the oath of office, inflation has gone up 11%. And I know people keep saying that 8.3% was year to year last month, but for the people back home that's listening, what they care about is gas prices are double since Joe Biden took office. They care about eggs being up 22%. They care about bacon being up 17%. They care about chicken being up 16%. They care about bread being up 14% year to year. That's what's affecting real Americans. I also wanna ask a quick question. Um, do you think it's acceptable that private taxpayer information has been shared and reported publicly? I'm not aware of any private, there is the ProPublica. Um, and that was a year ago today, was the ProPublica leak. Are, well, do you we don't know that it was a leak. We don't know how that information got into the public domain. Um, what tangible this is steps? This a very serious matter. I got 25 is, seconds. What tangible steps have you or the IRS or Treasury done to look into if it was a leak within the IRS? We've referred it to all of the independent investigators. Have you got any update from those investigators that no, anything's I, happening? No, I haven't, and I don't want to interfere with their investigations. We have our Inspector General, the Treasury. The I see my IRS, time's expired. Inspector General, the FBI, um, all, all of these groups have independent investigative authority and they need to look at it thoroughly. It is a leak of this type of information is a crime and we take it very seriously and I will not interfere with those investigations. Thank the gentleman for his questions and now we'll proceed to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, to inquire. Good morning, Secretary Ellen. 
Nice to see you back, Ways and Means Committee. In March, I wrote to you suggesting the Department issue regulations on irrevocable, irrevocable grantor trust to limit rampant abuse of the infamous stepped-up basis loophole. And we talked a good game about tax reform, and we didn't do anything, really. We tried. I appreciate your response and your willingness to work on the issue. This loophole is used by some of the wealthiest Americans as a way to avoid paying their fair share. And we're defining it. I think both sides are zeroing in on that, really. We speak more of it than they do. Can you tell me specifically how and when the Treasury Department and the Internal Revenue Service will implement their guidance? We are working very hard on that. And yeah, I heard I that promise before, but when? Be very soon, very soon. Thank you. The tax gap is $1 trillion a year, according to the IRS. At a recent oversight subcommittee hearing, the GAO reported audit rates have dropped significantly more for those incomes over $200,000 than the rest of the population. How will tax compliance improve with the resources requested in the budget for the IRS? Just 10 percent of the calls the IRS received this year were answered by an assistant. That's another story, the IRS. But I'm, I'm talking, that's under your jurisdiction. But I want to know, are we requesting enough people that can answer folks' questions? Ten percent is not a good grade. It's a bad grade, and um, it stinks. It, it's it's awful, and it reflects the fact that the IRS is hugely under-resourced. They have. Um, essentially the same number of employees that they had 40 years ago. Right. And they just don't have the resources to enforce the tax code, to go after high-income taxpayers um, who are responsible for the lion's share of that tax gap that you... Uh, I uh, believe signed. our economy, Madam Secretary, is going strong with signs of enduring health. Inflation is perhaps a top concern, should be. How do you balance urgency to lower inflation with care to preserve our strong economy? The Fed chairman, Mr. Powell, recently made some disturbing remarks to me. He publicly proclaimed he'd like to raise the unemployment rate and lower workers' wages to fight inflation. I have that interview right here. I mean, has he lost his mind or what? Or, and do you agree with this? Well, let me say I'm not going to comment on the Federal Reserve. They have a primary role in bringing inflation down, and um, it's up to them how they go about doing it. But um, my own uh, goal would be to keep the economy operating in the neighborhood of full employment while bringing inflation down. We have, over the last year and a half, made remarkable progress in terms of recovery in the labor market. Um, as Chair Neal pointed out, there are uh, two vacancies for every unemployed worker, about the strongest labor market we've seen in the post-war period, and um, we want to keep it that way while taking steps to bring inflation down. And uh, complementing what the Fed does, I think we can um, look to somewhat more deficit reduction as a complementary measure and um, try, to, try to pass legislation that would address some of the most burdensome um, costs that fall on households, whether it's for taking care of children or prescription drugs or for health care premiums. I must Thank yield the back, gentleman. Madam Secretary, but it seems that the antidote is worse than the poison here we're trying to correct. Thank the gentleman. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Yellen. Thank you for being here. I do have to congratulate you on the recovery we're seeing from COVID, and I think the recovery primarily is uh, due to the fact that 
Build Back Better did not pass. And the pro-growth policies that we put in place uh, under President Trump remain in effect. And thank goodness that the, those policies did not pass. It sure, surely would slow our recovery. Inflation is the number one thing that I hear about when I go uh, home. It, it, it's, I, I was in a restaurant recently speaking to a retired police officer, and he said, you know, at the end of the, he, he gets Social Security and a little pension check, and he said, at the end of the month, I used to have money left, and now what can I do? I can't put, I can't put gas in my car. And uh, Moody's says 8% inflation costs the average family $343 a month. $343 a month, according to Moody's. Uh, the biggest, outside of faulty monetary policy, which you've played a part in, I think the biggest driver of inflation is energy prices. And uh, I know you like to blame, blame that on the Ukraine war, but in fact, uh, in January 21, when President Biden took office, the, the cost of uh, gasoline for all grades was $2.40 in the United States. In February 22, the month before the Ukrainian war, it was $3.60. So it had gone up 50% before the Ukrainian war, before Russians started amassing on the Ukrainian border. My, my, my question really here is, is the Biden administration intentionally driving up energy prices? Because it sure looks to me like they are. Uh, day one, he halted new leases when he took office and he on federal lands and he withdrew the Keystone Pipeline permit. He slow walked permits for various stages of oil production since then on existing leases. Two weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, he took to the public pulpit and reiterated his suspension of leasing on federal lands for no reason other than, I think, to drive up the cost of fuel. Three weeks ago, as gas hit $4 a gallon in South Carolina, he announced that he was withdrawing permits for uh, drilling in Alaska and, uh, excuse me, uh, leasing for uh, drilling in Alaska and in the Gulf of Mexico apparently trying to drive gasoline above, above $4 a gallon. It was effective. And then uh, two weeks ago in Japan, he said, well, there's an upside to high fuel prices because it'll ease the great transition. Interesting phraseology, if you'll Google that, you'll see some interesting results. So, you know, it, right, it comes from supply and demand. Couldn't the federal government do more to increase supply? Do you not think that his withdrawing of federal leasing and slow walking yeah. permits and there, there are nine thousand? Do, do, do you not believe that the federal government could do more to increase supply and drive down the cost of fuel? I, I guess the bottom line question is: Is this increase in fuel prices intentional on the Biden administration? It is, of because it seems not to me that it is irrefutable. It, it is an enormous burden on American households. And of I agree. Course, I agree. It, it seems like it's an intentional effort on the, the Biden administration. The president is authorized uh, a million barrel a day release from the strategic petroleum Which is a drop in the bucket. It's a, it, it's a showpiece. And you know it. You know it's a showpiece. There show. are 9,000 permits that have answer. been they issued. Want, they want American Mr. Rice, and more for gas. To ease the acres. great transition. Mr. Rice, could we let the secretary answer, please? Sure. There are 9,000 permits that have been issued that the oil and gas sector can take advantage of and 20 million acres of public lands under lease right now that are not being produced on. Um, so there's nothing more they could do to I increase I think production. American producers saw low prices after the pandemic, lost money, and cut their drilling activity, oil supplies declined, and the high prices that prevail right now we can are a huge the, incentive. We can speak in circles thank the gentleman and thank the witness. We will now the proceed truth. to a two to one ratio for questioning uh, based on committee practice. And let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you, Madam Secretary, for including tax credit refundability in the budgets tax reform package to support low and middle income families who grow their families through adoption and especially for those who adopt foster children. I applaud the President's support for reducing child poverty and that is why I championed modernizing the child independent care tax credit 
which specifically targets low-income working parents with $4,000 or $8,000 to help cover child care costs. This tax credit, paired with the CTC, provides critical support that reduces child poverty. Without the CDTC, the CTC simply evaporates paying for child care and can't help working parents pay for food, housing, or health care. Could you confirm for me, Madam Secretary, that the administration sees the refundable CDCTC as key to helping low-income working families? Yes, I think it's a very important support to working families, the child tax credit. Um, the, these, are, um, these are very important supports. And also, um, I have a request, and that is I'd like to know for each of the refundable credits how these credits impacted families and workers this year compared to previous years. So I don't have those statistics at my fingertips. I can tell you that the child tax credit um, re is estimated to have reduced child poverty last year by 50%. It had an enormous impact um, and could try to get you some statistics for other, other programs. So I would suggest that it is absolutely clear that these credits are seriously important to low and moderate income families, and we must keep them moving and keep them in place. I completely agree and very supportive of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and now you're back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to inquire. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Yellen, for um, being here to talk about some very important topics. Um, the President's budget would help solve some of the biggest challenges we all agree that we face. Um, for example, we've heard from constituents about their frustrations with the tax filing season, and that's why the President's budget invests in modernizing the IRS and providing the customer service that taxpayers deserve. Most of us also understand that we're facing an existential threat in climate change, and that's why his budget invests in a future that is livable on this planet. And we're all hearing from working families who are worried about, of course, the rising costs of, of goods. That's why this budget invests in lowering their health care premiums and the costs of raising a child. Um, Secretary Yellen, I, I want to really drill down on this last point because we've heard a lot of revisionist history today about inflation. Um, some of my colleagues are suggesting that the lifelines, the lifelines that we included in the American Rescue Plan are somehow responsible for inflation. Um, they want to just ignore all of the global disruption that we've lived through over the past couple of years from the global pandemic to Russia's war in Ukraine. And they want to convince working families that the basic supports that they count on to survive are actually somehow to blame for high prices. They want families to believe that our expansion of the child tax credit and child dependent care credit was somehow a bad thing for them. Never mind that the, the fact that these supports finally lowered their costs and allowed them to afford basic necessities for their households. Um, Secretary Yellen, I would like if you could help me set the record straight. Can you expand on how small the cost of supports like the child tax credit are compared with the size of the overall economy? Yes. I mean, with respect to inflation, it is, of course, a huge problem and a primary focus. But many factors have led to higher inflation. That includes multiple COVID variants, supply chain bottlenecks that have affected many countries, COVID-related shutdowns in production, and most recently, Russia's 
invasion of Ukraine, and the child tax credit was a relatively small expenditure. It was spent out over the full year of 2021, and I think it accounts for very little of the inflation we have seen. And of course, it achieved a massive reduction in childhood poverty and financial insecurities. Um, you know, families used the additional resources in part to feed their children. Perhaps that had a small impact on food prices, but what's really important is that many fewer kids went hungry. Thank you, I think that's important. I think you said 50% of out of poverty as a result of that. Can you talk about how strengthening those supports would give families some solid footing while we try to deal with the true drivers of inflation? Yes, um, I, you know, clearly the child tax credit is something that helps a large number of low and middle income families and um, really lets them afford the things that children need from um, a roof over their heads to adequate food on the table and um, the ability to buy back to school supplies. So it's very important, and especially at a time when food and energy uh, expenses have gone up for global reasons. We're seeing that everywhere around the world. This, uh, the child tax credit would give them a little bit of breathing room to help them deal uh, with these expenses. So it's very important, and um, we can provide that and certainly pay for it. Um, the, the president's budget proposes um, many ways to pay for expenditures that would be helpful to families, and they wouldn't fall, the, the burden wouldn't fall at all on any individuals making, or households making under $400,000 a year. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swikert, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Madam Secretary, and this is always tough when we're trying to do this in, what, three and a half minute increments. Um, uh, some of my fellow members have already said or asked, um, so I want to take a slightly different, um, and this probably won't be in your notes. Um, inflationary environment. Um, we have a number of economists now who actually be believe um, it has grown to be much more structural in, in, at a number of levels and um, beyond you know, the supply chain portion calculation. If it's true that we're in a higher inflationary environment for three years, five years, to the end of the decade. We're working on a math project right now, what it does to particularly retirees, to the working poor, and the distortive effect, particularly when you start to look at our formula on Medicare co-payments, the fact the Medicare trust fund, even though we got a semi-positive actuarial report, you know, 30, 36, 38 months, has Treasury started to do any possible calculations of the percentage of our brothers and sisters who are in retirement who will be in poverty in the next few years functionally because of the structural inflation, even with the COLA adjustments, which never get close, and then with the health care, which is dramatically more in this, and the part of Social Security goes into that. I'm in great concern that we're focusing on today's inflation number and not realizing the economic devastation that we're going to see throughout the coming decade. So I don't have any um, numbers to offer you right this minute, but um, I believe there are simulations that that look at what the effect would be. But um, there's no, I, I see no way in which inflation is a decade-long um, matter. The Federal Reserve is committed to bringing down inflation. We're committed to bringing down inflation. Uh, I well, in, but Madam Secretary, and this is, you, you know, you and I have known each other a long time. You've been very kind to me in the past, um, but you're a labor economist. Oh, no, I'm good, and you and I had some fascinating demographic discussions. This is different than 40 years ago. The demographic curve we're in is much more difficult. And um, yes, we can. The, the Federal Reserve can push up unemployment as one of my Democrat members and, and create the misery, but the structural issues I see, particularly for our over 65 population, 
There's some ugliness out there in the numbers. Um, and, and can I throw one other thing at you? And this is always hard when we're doing this at, at rapid pace. You keep referring to an international minimum tax as fairness. We've whiteboarded this multiple times on your numbers, and we'd see no fairness as long as the rest of the world is using a refundable VAT tax. You and I have had the VAT conversation. If Germany exports, they remove the VAT. If we import to them, so they purchase, they add the VAT. How do you get a sort of ketibus paribus equalization unless your model is solely, hey, it's domestic production, domestic consumption in each country? Then you're making a fairness argument. But from an international trade standpoint, we functionally have structurally a made in America tax because we don't use a value added tax model, the rest of the world does. And your model is not offsetting anything close to those numbers. I I'll mean, let the general lady answer the question, please. They're able to rebate those taxes because the imposition of a tax raises, raises the costs of all of their domestic producers. And so it, it's WTO consistent to offset what would be the adverse impact of that VAT on their international trade. I don't see that as an advantage. The purpose of the global agreement is to make sure that all corporations, whether that are heavily engaged in international business, whether they're based in the United States uh, or in Europe or in the Cayman Islands, that all of them um, are forced to pay at least a minimum tax of 15% on their, on their income, and that does level the playing field. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you also um, to Madam Secretary. Um, I know that, uh, like the Committee uh, on Ways and Means, the Department of Treasury has launched a dedicated initiative uh, to uh, advance equity in all of its work. Last year, the leadership at Treasury established an equity hub charged with coordinating these efforts and ensuring that, um, that our economic prosperity is for all Americans uh, with diverse communities throughout the country. Early accomplishments associated with this initiative include the Treasury's collaboration with the Committee on Ways and Means to uh, prioritize equity in the American Rescue Plan. Um, I know that many of my Republican colleagues have uh, attacked uh, the American Rescue Plan as adding to our inflation that we currently have and to our trouble um, that, uh, you know, um, that we're currently experiencing, the difficulty we're currently experiencing. I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about how important some of the equity issues like uh, increasing child tax credit and the earned income tax credit uh, were um, in the American Rescue Plan in leveling the playing field, as well as allowing economically disadvantaged individuals um, a focus on uh, prioritizing their swift um, um, or, or their 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 economic uh, prosperity uh, being uh, hastened by it. Um, I personally think that uh, the budget that the president has outlined, uh, including the new market tax credit permanency. Um, also, along with the child tax credit and other things that we did, is an effort to level the playing field. In my district alone, New Market Tax Credit Program has delivered $740 million in project financing and creating over 500, sorry, over 5,000 jobs in my district alone. Can you talk a little bit about how the American Rescue Plan was a necessary a way of us getting out of this uh, pandemic uh, and how your um, commitment, your department's commit, commitment on equity um, uh, will, and leveling the playing field include such, uh, such initiatives as well as new market tax credits and others. Sure. Um, you know, the pandemic was brutally unfair in the fact that it impacted um, low-income workers and especially minorities more severely than really anyone else in the economy, although it was a blow to, to everyone. And in designing the American Rescue Plan, foremost in mind 
was making sure that those communities and households that were most severely affected would be fairly treated and get the relief that they needed. And that was true in all aspects of its design and implementation. You measured the child, you mentioned the child tax credit, which was critically important in supporting families. It's true of the um, rental assistance program, which um, was particularly directed toward low-income families that had suffered such severe losses in income and were at danger of losing their homes. The Homeowners Assistance Fund, uh, the money that was set aside for CDFIs and minority depository institutions um, that is particularly directed at low-income and minority communities so that they have access to capital that they need. Um, our focus is in state and local fiscal recovery funds, um, really urging state and local governments to prioritize affordable housing, which is, and of course, the proposal to make the new market tax credit permanent in this year's Green Book um, directed at um, affordable housing, which is an enormous burden, especially on minority uh, communities. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Washington State, Ms. Delbeni, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this incredibly important hearing, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for being with us today. We appreciate all of your work. Um, and thank you for highlighting the importance of the expanded child tax credit. Um, we need to continue um, that effort to support lifting children out of poverty across the country. Um, you talked about affordable housing, and I think there's clear consensus from the administration, from members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, and economists that um, we need more affordable housing um, to help families, um, definitely um, to help rein in inflation, but we had a challenge with affordable housing prior to the pandemic. Um, I've seen it in my district, um, so many families who are seeing skyrocketing rents, um, not just in urban areas and rural areas, in our tribal communities. So I welcome the White House's efforts on this. Um, I've introduced bipartisan legislation called the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act with representatives Beyer and Walorski and Wenstrup, um, and it would strengthen and expand the low-income housing tax credit, <clears throat> what we call the housing credit, um, and, uh, you know, there are two cost-efficient ways to increase housing credit production. Um, one, to simply extend and increase the allocation of housing credits received by each state and to lower the amount of bonds needed to access 4% housing cr um, credits from 50% to 25%. Um, then we can double the amount of affordable housing production. Uh, I wondered if you could speak to how expanding the low income housing tax credit would help families with inflationary price pressures and also um, what the administration is doing to help us make sure we make this a priority. So it is a priority. Affordable housing is front and center on President Biden's um, radar screen and um, he's looking at a whole host of um, proposals to make a difference there. The low-income housing tax credit, of course, is crucial, and it's something that allows families to spend their dollars on other family expenses. So it's critical. We're working on um, trying to make sure that um, we work on regulations. There are issues around the average income regulations that need to be clarified to make sure uh, that that becomes more effective. And this is a high priority for us at Treasury. Um, just on that point on um, the income averaging rule, uh, last week I joined uh, colleagues in sending a bipartisan bicameral letter to you and to Commissioner Reddig requesting a swift finalization of the average median income test rule. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I think uh, the president announced last month that the IRS is gonna finalize the rule no later than September 30th, and I just wanted to see if you're on track to meet or e exceed this deadline so that um, we can make sure we have a final rule that will be workable with the 
low-income housing tax credit program. Yes, you, you can count on that. We hope to get it done. We expect to get it done this summer and try to address some of the problems that have been raised in connection with the rule that I believe was finalized in November of 2020. Thank the gentlelady. Thank Let you. me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Walarski, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to say that inflation is hammering Hoosiers, but I have to say, after being in the district, that the inflation in this country is a flat-out disgrace. There's no way to try to blame this or switch this on anything other than this administration's policies. I cannot believe every week at the grocery store and the gas pump. I mean, these aren't just stories. This is the American people, and they are so fed up with it. And they're transmitting that to us as urgently as they can. But I just have to say that I've never seen anything like what's happening in this economy. Inflation at a 40-year peak continues to spiral out of control. Gas in my district went to 525 a gallon, which is an absolute disgrace. Increasing prices on gas and everyday necessities are hurting Hoosiers, to say the least. And I can just tell you, increasing prices on gas and everyday necessities are hurting everybody in this district from seniors to working people who can barely afford on a fixed income, our seniors, to be forced to choose between food and fuel. The administration's policies have given us climbing gas prices, persistent supply chain bottlenecks, workforce shortages, and surging inflation. The need for relief has never been greater. But the question I have, uh, Secretary Yellen, in order to provide inflation relief to America's manufacturers, small business, and consumers, I, along with many of my colleagues on this committee, have pushed for a robust Section 301 exclusion process, which the Trump administration implemented for the majority of the time the Section 301 tariffs were in place. I have seen your recent comments and understand that you are evaluating, reviewing the existing Section 301 tariffs. Can you provide additional insight into the administration's review of Section 301 tariffs and if a more robust exclusion process is under consideration? Those things are under consideration. You know, this administration inherited a set of 301 tariffs imposed by the Trump administration that I think really weren't designed to serve our strategic interests. Um, China certainly is, I think, guilty of unfair trade practices we need to protect against, um, ensure our national security, that our supply chains are secure and resilient, and um, their policies need to make sure that they address that. But um, so I believe some of the tariffs did not serve, really ended up being paid by Americans, not by the Chinese, um, hurt American consumers and businesses, and we are uh, taking a look at those and um, Look, looking to be able to address, um, so re to reconfigure those tariffs in a way that would be more strategic. Um, so that is something where- do we have any kind of a timeline, Madam Secretary? Is there any kind of a timeline as to where we can have an additional conversation on that? Um, I, I think in the, in the coming weeks, um, we expect, I can't give you a firm timeline, but um, with respect to the exclusion process and tariffs. Um, that's something that's under active consideration. Thank the gentlelady. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to inquire. Secretary Yellen, thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to follow up on a letter that Senator Elizabeth Warren and I sent to you and Commissioner Reddick in April. This letter requested information on steps that Treasury and IRS are taking to ensure that low-income taxpayers are not unfairly audited at far greater rates, and we are still awaiting a response. I'm encouraged that Treasury's budget request highlights the need for new resources and especially new skilled staff, including revenue agents, to focus on tax fairness and audits of large businesses, partnerships, and high-wealth individuals. How would these resources change the audit strategy of the IRS to lift the unfair burden on low-income taxpayers, especially EITC filers who are audited at 4.5 times greater a rate than other taxpayers with less than $500,000? Uh, 
So first, let me thank you for your very thoughtful letter. And I think um, what's happened here is that over the course of the last decade, the resources available to the IRS have been simply gutted, and it's meant it doesn't have the capacity to enforce our tax laws as they apply to high-end evaders. Um, so what's happened is that the audit rates at the top of the wealth and income distribution have fallen off um, far more quickly than the audit rates of those at the bottom. And that is simply utterly unfair. And um, it doesn't um, address the tax gap estimated at $7 trillion over the next decade. Um, that tax gap reflects underpayment by high income taxpayers. So um, we very much hope that Congress will provide the long-term assured funding that the IRS needs to hire those professionals who have the skills and are able to um, audit the tax Thank returns you. of um, high income taxpayers and Thank to you. collect that revenue. Yes, thank you for that. And I want to highlight an important item you have in your budget to fight inflation. It affects my area of Southern California, which is one of the most expensive housing and rental markets in the country. That's why I was so glad to see that in addition to e increased funding for the Community Development Financial Institution Fund, which assists in providing underserved communities with access to capital and played a critical role in providing them PPP loans, uh, Treasury is also proposing to create a new dedicated CDFI affordable housing supply fund. Could you talk about what impact this funding could have in combating inflation in the rental and housing market and why CDFIs are the right vehicle to deliver these funds? Well, c affordable housing, of course, is we've had a shortage of that dating to before the pandemic, and it's only been worsened by recent trends, rental prices, um, are rising very rapidly, and so it's become a very critical issue. And CDFIs have the capacity to be able to make loans and understand uh, communities that often lack access to funding for affordable housing. So we think this is an, is an initiative that could be very helpful. Thank, Thank you. the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, to inquire. Do you please put your microphone on, Mr. Kildee? It was not intentional. <laughs> you, you want to try another one, Mr. Boyle? Test. In 10 years, you'll be able to get up to the top it's, row. It's working, it's working <laughs> They're working, it's working right here. All right. Okay. Mr. Kildee is recognized. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Yellen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing. Thanks for being here. There are two issues I would like to raise with you, if I could, that are specific uh, to people that I represent. Uh, one has to do with the injustice affecting thousands of Michiganders and others around the country, um, the Delphi salaried retirees who, as you may know, um, in concert with General Motors bankruptcy, when that bankruptcy occurred, this subset of employees were really singled out and suffered draconian cuts to their pensions uh, under the PBGC management. Uh, some of them losing 70% of their pensions, 20,000 of these retirees affected, thousands of whom I represent. Uh, I've introduced bipartisan legislation and bicameral legislation, the Susan Muffley Act, along with Senator Sherrod Brown in Ohio, that would restore the benefits of the Delphi salaried retirees. And I know that President Biden ha has indicated um, that he supports finding a remedy for these retirees. 
And so I'd like to ask if you have thoughts or could articulate what the administration's position may be on the legislation that we've introduced. It's bipartisan, bicameral, and would, would address this issue. So first of all, let me say, I know this is an issue that's been um, difficult to resolve around for a long time and that the issues are complicated, strongly support attempting to find a legislative solution. I'd be glad to have my staff look at the legislation that you've proposed to give you a reaction and um, try to be helpful. We certainly support a legislative solution. Well, I do appreciate that. I know we've, we've made effort to try to resolve this short of a legislative step, but it seemed that that was going to be the only resolution. We've come up with a legislative solution that, again, has bipartisan and bicameral support. So I look forward to working with your team uh, to try to find a path forward on this. The second issue has to do with uh, another important aspect of the challenges that the communities I represent face, and it has to do with the Opportunity Zone legislation, which, as you know, passed in 2017, has afforded fairly significant incentives for investment in uh, chronically distressed census tracts. Unfortunately, when the legislation was drafted, it excluded some of the most logical locations for investment, including census tracts that, like the one I represent in Flint, the old Buick City site, that has zero population. It's an entire census tract, and as a result of it, it has no data to qualify it uh, for opportunity zone status. We have introduced uh, legislation that would identify these particular circumstances and include them as eligible opportunity zone tracks. It's the most logical use of the tool, as a matter of fact. And I was hoping you might offer your thoughts or support from the administration on this fix that we've come up with. Well, I'm aware of this issue, and it seems like one that does call for a legislative solution. As you know, under TCJA, the opportunity zones had to be designated by the governors within 180 days of the law's passage. So there really isn't anything that Treasury can do on its own um, to change the designations. So I think a legislative um, fix is in order here. Thank you very much, Secretary Yellen. I appreciate all your work, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Secretary Yellen, welcome. Uh, frankly, Secretary Yellen, I wish you would be here more. With everything going on in the economy, I think this is the second time you've been here in 18 months. Madam Secretary, uh, like so many, so many of my colleagues here today um, have talked about it, I just spent the last two weeks in my district in central and west central Illinois, and the two biggest issues are gas and groceries. That's what everybody talks about. It transcends everything. And you look at uh, what inflation has done, and it's really a tax on the American people. Uh, and, and the people that make the least are the ones that are most affected by it. To highlight this, two weeks ago at a gas station in Peoria, Illinois, in my district, Beachler's Gas Station, we lowered the price of gas with an organization, Americans for Prosperity, to 230. That's what it was when the Biden administration came in, was at 230. Of course, it's 530 now in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, and so uh, for two hours, we had literally people lined up for miles, five mile long line. And I talked to a lot of those folks, single moms, working families, uh, low, low income folks uh, that were filling up with gas and just extremely frustrated in the level of anxiety and, and people that are real fearful of what's going on in the economy. And, and so uh, as I listen to you here today and I look at uh, what's not been done by this administration, it, it, it's really perplexing in a lot of ways on whether the administration is tone deaf or unaware or becoming aware of it right now. I go back and I look at what President Obama's Treasury Secretary Larry Summers said, alerting the administration in February of 21 about uh, the, the fear of this and what was going to happen and why something wasn't done there. So um, I, I want to I talk, um, I want to pivot for a second and talk about uh, the budget of the Treasury Department, because that's what we're here today to discuss. Um, as I look at the Biden administration's FY23 budget proposal, the budget proposal includes $4 trillion in tax hikes on U.S. companies, including targeted tax hikes on U.S. energy, as I look at the budget. Um, 
uh, my question, Secretary Yellen, is, uh, is, is hitting U.S. businesses with $4 trillion in tax hikes helpful to lowering the cost of goods for consumers, yes or no? To the extent that um, inflation is a matter of demand and supply, some deficit reduction certainly seems like it's appropriate to complement the steps that the Federal Reserve is taking to bring down inflation. But look, gas prices are an enormous problem. You're absolutely right about that. It's an enormous burden on American households. We need to do everything we can to address that, and the President is doing that. It is a global market. Gas prices track global oil prices. Well, this is uh, a problem all over the world. I understand that, Madam Secretary, and I have limited time. You know, when we look at, again, the work shortage out there, again, can't find enough truck drivers, can't find enough nurses, not enough uh, engineers, mechanics. So again, I look at your budget and, and trying to figure out how $4 trillion in new taxes is good for the labor market. And then secondly, you know, um, fuel affects everything, manufacturing, production of food, transportation. I don't think taxes is the path to do that. No, I know I my time has expired. Uh, Mr. Yes. Chairman, if I could just submit for the record a document from um, Republican Committee on House Ways and Means titled Mythbuster, no, the child tax credit doesn't reduce poverty by half, and it discourages work. Thank so you. ordered. Uh, let the gentlelady respond to that, if you'd like, Madam Secretary. No, it's fine. Okay. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, during the past 24 months of the COVID pandemic, there are various uh, estimates as to how much we've spent, uh, four and a half to five and a half trillion dollars. Um, how much, what would have happened had we not done that at that time, relative to the American economy and relative to the global economy? Well, we faced when President Biden was elected the possibility that unemployment would stay at exceptionally high levels for um, a very long time. We, we could have had a situation, it certainly was a risk, as great as the Great Depression. And I think that that was the overwhelming risk facing the administration. When you remember that the biggest burdens fell on the lowest income households, um, both the health burdens and the economic burdens. It was critical to make sure that we didn't have a generation that was scarred, whose lives would be impacted forever. And the success of the policy that was adopted is that we have an economy with the strongest labor market, um, arguably in the entire post-war period. And um, workers, are, are finding new work that pays them higher wages. The quit rate, which is in a way a measure of how secure workers feel about their outside opportunities and the outside offers they're getting, that has reached records. And um, household financial security, the average balances that even the lowest income households have in their bank account has gone up. The Federal Reserve recently conducted a study. They routinely ask households, could you afford a $400 um, unexpected expense? And since the survey started, the most recent is the largest fraction of Americans who said that they could manage a $400 um, expense. So. Um, We've had a real recovery. The job market is strong. Without question, inflation is way too high and has to be brought down. But most of that is reflects um, issues related to the pandemic as it's affected global supply chains, caused shortages of things like semiconductors and energy and food prices that have been dramatically impacted globally, United States and elsewhere, by Russia's war against Ukraine. Well, Madam Secretary, I must tell you, I admire your, uh, 
your response because typically it's members to take up most of the time of those they're questioning. <laughs> My time's up. <laughs> but I just want to, you, you, you subscribe or, or support the statement that because of what we had to do in the short term, put out a lot of money into an economy that's 70 percent consumption, that we had too much money chasing too few goods. And to what extent is that the reason for the inflationary rate as it is today? I know about global supply chains. I know about disruption. I know about uh, uh, gas prices. But I'm just curious that, you know, what is the answer if you, you have to do something in the short term to save the economy from collapsing, but the longer term or intermediate term that creates a problem like inflation? Answer briefly, please, yes. Madam Secretary. So um, that spending produced excellent re rewards for Americans, and at most it contributed modestly to inflation. Thank the, the gentlelady. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to inquire. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, this will actually flow nicely from the, the last exchange you just had. Um, we look at the labor um, market, as you pointed out. We are at a 50-year low in terms of our unemployment rate, arguably the greatest labor market in American history, or at least since World War II, completely contrary to all of the predictions that were made uh, more than a year ago. In fact, our economic growth, and specifically our job growth, is so much better than other Western similar countries coming out of the COVID experience, I was wondering if you could offer a few thoughts on why the United States economy has done so much better than every other country around the world. Well, I think you're absolutely right. We're, we all have high inflation, but the United States is enjoying the strongest recovery, certainly in terms of employment, but also in terms of growth, we're only, we're above, our GDP is above pre-pandemic level and only slightly below trend. And the reason for it is that we put in place a large fiscal package to address the shortfall in jobs right. and in output we had in our economy and to address the pain and suffering that especially the lowest income households were are suffering, and we've been very successful. Um, that aspect of the program has been tremendously successful in creating um, around 8.7 million jobs since President Biden took office oh. and bring, restoring full employment. When you remember um, the financial crisis that struck in 2008, it took a decade. Years, to years and years to get back to and full one, employment. And yeah. State and local governments that were really in bad shape because of the pandemic, they're now in excellent fiscal shape because of the relief. And, um, you know, there we saw huge cutbacks back in 2008 9 in state and local government workers. And um, we, we avoided that this yeah. time. And so. There have been many benefits from that program. Madam Secretary, if I could uh, quickly, in the minute I have remaining, switch gears for a second. Uh, something I have been working on for, I, I think, seven years now is attempting to change the rather insane way we deal with the issue of the debt ceiling in, in this country. Uh, Senator Durbin and I have a bill I wanted to bring to your attention that would actually change the mechanism by which we raise the debt ceiling. We would still have a debt ceiling but actually the Treasury Secretary would have the ability to raise it. Congress would reserve the right to overrule that if Congress were to vote. Um, but without, unlike now, without an affirmative action from Congress, the Treasury Secretary could, could act. If you could offer your thoughts and if you could also bring us briefly up to speed on when you think the next uh, date is by which we have to raise the debt ceiling. So first of all, let me say I am strongly supportive of the kind of initiative Thank that you, um, you mentioned. It, it, it is simply insanity to face a debt ceiling crisis periodically. Um, 
uh, I'll have to get back to you to update you on when I think it could next strike. We have had um, enormous uh, su positive surprise in terms of tax revenue and deficit reduction, I think reflective of the strong recovery, and hopefully that's pushed out. Thank, I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Um, you know, of critical importance is to, in realigning our nation, is up to, of critical importance to us is realigning our nation's supply chain. Uh, because if you had told me that when I was a surgeon in Iraq, that my protective equipment and my pharmaceuticals relied on an adversary, China, especially our military, I would say, how, how did we get here? We never should have let our nation be put in such a vulnerable position as this. Unfortunately, the policies that we're seeing from the administration are going to make it more difficult to turn this ship around, and already are. You know, by pouring trillions of dollars more into the economy than is necessary, we have fueled an inflation crisis, and uh, it's the likes of which most Americans have never seen. And now everyday necessities are increasingly difficult for Americans to afford, from gas to housing to groceries. The President's fiscal year 23 budget doubles down on these bad policies. You know, you can look at Putin's full-scale war against Ukraine, uh, that I arguably would say that we helped fund by this administration's policies, that has added to the energy price spike. And Americans were seeing troubling price increases long before the invasion because of these same policies. So I, I worry that these, these policies will, have, will leave us with inflation long after Ukraine wins this war, God willing that they do. So, Secretary Yellen, the proposed budget by the President would increase the U.S. Corporate, corporate tax rate to 28 percent, which climbs even higher when you add in state and local taxes. It's the highest in the developed world. And perhaps most disappointing is that this rate is higher than communist China, which has a headline corporate tax rate of 25 percent. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made us more competitive that increased jobs in America, more people going back to work than ever, increased revenues to the government because more people were working than ever. So COVID took that away, so opening up the economy with these, with these tax incentives in place, these tax benefits in place, help us. But inflation and increased taxes, which are being proposed and which we're dealing with, really hurt our supply chain. And they send our supply chain right to countries like China, and that's the last thing we need, because it's dangerous. When our supply chain is at risk, it's dangerous for our nation's economic security, our nation's national security, and our nation's health security. So how are we going to uh, accomplish turning around and solving our supply chain problem when the administration is advoc advocating for policies that are proven to send suppliers and jobs overseas while making the United States less competitive than the very adversaries that we're trying to compete against. We're very focused on supply chains and agree that they need to be made more resilient. And um, I would strongly disagree with your assessment, both of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It resulted in very substantial losses in corporate tax revenue, and the uh, proposals... Yeah, more people were paying taxes than ever before because they were working, so I would strongly we disagree with you, and, and I yield back. They're working now, too. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and Madam Secretary, thank you for bringing a very accurate perspective on the complicated inflation issue. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that um, if we're talking about too much money chasing too few goods, the vast, vast part of that money was approved on a bipartisan basis under the Trump administration. And, and the very small part of it was the American Rescue Plan. Secretary Yellen, we learned over the last year, based on IRS tax data, that some of the wealthiest Americans pay no federal income taxes each year. The average tax rate paid by the top 25 billionaires is a little over 3%. That's far below the 13% paid by the average American family. So obviously nurses and teachers and police officers are paying a much higher tax rate than billionaires. 
The administration and the president have proposed an innovative minimum tax on American households worth more than $100 million. Could you explain this proposal in a little more detail and, and how would it get the top 100th of 1% of Americans to pay their fair share in taxes? Thank you. Well, under current laws, you said some of the wealthiest Americans pay very little in tax. They receive income as capital gains, but those capital gains aren't taxed until they're realized and they can escape taxation entirely at the end. So the proposed um, minimum income tax um, would impose a minimum tax of 20% on total income, and that would be inclusive of those unrealized capital gains and would apply to all taxpayers with wealth greater than $100 million. It would affect very few taxpayers, about one in 10,000, um, but it would enable, um, enable collection of taxes on income that is severely undertaxed and often goes in un untaxed entirely. Um, it would be levied in such a way that the initial tax that was due could be pays, paid in nine annual installments and uh, address the issue of some taxpayers who have liquid assets. They would be able to defer paying minimum taxes um, on these non-tradable assets, but there would be a deferral charge. So um, I think this is a well-crafted proposal, and um, I think it would get it something that really allows the highest income um, earners in the United States uh, to pay, as you said, less than most workers do who rely on W-2 wage and salary income. You know, you, you mentioned that this would um, trying to deal with those capital gains that are locked in. That, um, would this proposal push them to reinvest that capital in more productive assets? Yes, because one of the problems with our current tax code is that in order to avoid realizing capital gains and paying taxes, um, investors often feel locked in. They just stick with investments that may not be productive anymore, but it becomes a way to avoid uh, taxes and um, taxing these gains in the way this proposal suggests would reduce that lock-in effect and make for a more efficient allocation of capital in a more productive society. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary. One of my, one of my West Philadelphia constituents living on a fixed income recently wrote me about how we must regularly choose between paying her rent or paying for car repair. Madam Secretary, I know you understand that intense inflation is hurting American families. Hope, hope you would agree that boosting affordable housing is a key way to bring down the cost. My question to you, Madam Secretary, can you expand on the Biden-Harris administration commitment to strengthening and expanding effective tools to finance affordable housing, like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit and the New Market Tax Credit? Yes, um, strengthening uh, the provision of affordable housing is a critical priority for the president, and we're trying to do that uh, in a number of ways, including through the um, New Market uh, Tax Credit that we would like to make permanent. In addition, um, we are trying to reach as many vulnerable tenants and homeowners as we possibly can through the um, Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the Homeowners Assistance Fund um, with respect to the state and local fiscal relief funds. We're strongly encouraging their use also for affording affordable housing development. Madam Secretary, would you agree that expanding the EITC to younger workers is an important way to advance economic opportunity, particularly for young people of color, and make our tax code fair? Yes, I certainly do. I, I think the EITC um, expansion had a very positive impact 
um, you know, there are decades of research that show that it's one of the government's most powerful tools for poverty reduction. Um, but the EITC for workers that don't have children has historically been much smaller than the tax credit for families with children. And the ARP expanded eligibility and nearly tripled the um, EITC for workers without dependent children. So um, I think it had a very positive um, effect. Um, there were, I believe, roughly 17 million lower income workers without dependent children who qualified. And they typically um, are minorities and many live in rural areas. Madam Secretary, I thank you for your leadership in the Treasury Department and all that you're trying to do. And I yield back to the Chairman of the Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, after tax reform and, and regulatory relief, we as a nation experienced unprecedented economic prosperity. Uh, all boats rose on the tide of that prosperity. We, we had the lowest unemployment in decades. We had uh, the lowest poverty rate in the history. Um, jobs, we were hitting on all cylinders, COVID hits. But today, today, after 18 months of this administration, I believe that this administration has sown the wind of reckless economic policies and the American people have reaped the whirlwind of economic pain. The spending spree that lit a fire on inflation that has consumed every American, every worker, consumed their wages, consumed their purchasing power, consumed their livelihoods, irresponsible unemployment policies, welfare without work requirements, reasonable stuff that wouldn't trap and sideline labor so small businesses who were trying to get up on their feet after COVID could survive. But they couldn't hire anybody, Madam Secretary. Supply chain turmoil, tractors couldn't get, I mean, farmers couldn't get tractor parts, the fuel costs, the fertilizer just completely running away from them. Repeated warnings from Democrat economists like Larry Summers and Jason Furman, the San Francisco Fed, even the nonpartisan CBO said, don't do it, don't do it. And the Democrat, my colleagues, and your administration supported a partisan spending spree, this spending bill, not a single Republican supported it, that has been disastrous. And it, it has put us in a tailspin. And um, I pray we recover from it. But you would have to relent in the administration from the current policies. At the center of all this, Madam Secretary, of this self-inflicted economic disaster is an energy crisis that is pummeling working families, it's pummeling every American consumer. And I, I've heard the blame game. I've heard the pandemic. It's the pandemic. It's Vladimir Putin. It's, it's corporate greed. No, the runaway prices at the pump are just as self-inflicted because I have never seen a whole of government assault on an industry like I've seen from this administration. With all due respect, it, it, it is unbelievable that an industry that has blessed our country with safe and affordable and clean supply of energy, the lifeblood of the greatest economy in the world, and does it better and more environmentally friendly than anybody in the world and there is a relentless assault, and we wonder why the prices are completely out of control at the, plump, at the pump. And then you got this Treasury uh, Green Book with $45 billion in punitive taxes on, on that industry. This, after the litany of things, canceling pipelines, more regulations. When you tax and regulate something, you get less of something. You get less of something vis-a-vis -vis demand, consumers are gonna pay more. My question is, Instead of going to Saudi Arabia, will this administration, will you and the president commit to coming to West Texas? Because this president hasn't spent, set foot near any oil and gas facility, not production, not refining, not any operating facility in the United States, but he's going to Saudi Arabia to plead with a foreign country to produce more oil and gas to get us out of this mess. That's backwards. 
It's upside down. It's irrational. And I would like for you to please come see us in Texas so we can explain why we are where we are and help you get us out of this mess. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for joining us today and for your leadership amid these unique economic, economic times. I especially appreciate your commitment, stated again today, to, to tackle inflation, which I'll get to in a moment. First, I want to touch on helping ensure that U.S. companies, our companies, remain best positioned to compete in the global economy. And that in that, and in that context, I want to comment on the newly finalized foreign tax credit uh, rulings. Uh, I want to thank you and your team for being responsive to the concerns that my colleague, Mr. Hearn, and I and eight other members of this committee raised in a, a recent letter. I was glad to hear that the Treasury is considering issues we raised, a safe harbor on the royalties issue and additional guidance on the cost recovery provisions. And in light of the forthcoming guidance, which I applaud Treasury for providing, I do believe there's a case to be made for a modest delay in the effective date for certain of the coming FTC changes. When you were asked yesterday about a delay in your testimony before the Senate Finance Committee, you said that any changes made to these re re regulations could be applied retroactively. Yes. I think pausing the effective date until Treasury is able to provide new guidance would provide taxpayers with the information they need to better guide their long-term tax planning. And, and I have a concern that any retroactive relief would not make up for the current uncertainty surrounding this. I know we can talk about that, but I have limited time. So let me just say I appreciate the opportunity, look forward to continue working, but I want to shift to inflation. I think we can all agree that inflation is a very real problem, creating very real challenges for all Americans. In Illinois, gas is over $5 a gallon. Prices for food, housing, and basic living expenses are rising. I also think there's agreement that inflation is a global issue being driven by global factors, the pandemic and associated lockdowns, and then the subsequent bounce back when things reopen. Putin's war on Ukraine, worker shortages, computer ship short chip shortages, supply chain disruptions, and as you said, the worldwide supply chain disruptions, especially the food and energy. Lots of table pounding and finger pointing here today, but I think a more objective assessment of where we are has to conclude that in a complex and challenging global economy, the United States is in a very strong position to tackle the challenges of inflation. As you noted in your opening statement, Congress passed the CARES Act, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and the American Rescue Plan. From your perspective, in the little time we have left, where would we be if Congress hadn't acted, and what actions should we be taking now to have the biggest impact to help all Americans um, and to bring down the rate of inflation? Um. The American Rescue Plan um, had enormously favorable effects on the economic recovery. We have recovered and created more jobs than any country uh, in the world. All, all developed countries are suffering from high inflation, but we have had a miraculously rapid recovery and regained full employment. And I, I to think about what the situation, especially of low-income households, would be without the help that was provided by that plan. And their financial positions, although inflation is a very serious concern and has to be addressed, their financial situations are generally quite strong. Going forward, I think the President is doing everything he can to address high energy costs, to shelter costs, um, rents are the largest single item in household budgets, rents are increasing at a rapid rate, building affordable housing is critical, but I believe Congress and the administration can um, legislate programs that would cut critical costs that Americans face, whether it's for prescription drugs, for health care costs more generally, um, for utility costs. So for the medium term, the clean energy proposals that were um, in the House uh, passed bal uh, Balanced Budget Act, um, it, it, the House passed Build Back Better Act, um, would end up lowering utility costs for Thank households. the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Secretary, welcome and thank you for your service. Um, obviously, we've uh, talked a lot about things that have happened, but I also want to talk about looking forward. 
clearly the question that is on a lot of people's minds is recession. And obviously we heard um, you know, a, a, a gentleman this weekend talk about a hurricane off the coast, but what type of category are we dealing with when it comes to uh, the type of recession that we may face and most likely will face coming up here? We've had 12 recessions since 1945. Can we learn from those recessions? Well, I think it's hard to look back because we're in a different position at this point. We're in a different position because we had a COVID-induced shutdown and we have, a, we have the government-induced stimulus. So actually, we're, actually, we're in a position of strength to deal with any sort of recession that comes upon us. And I think that's because of the fiscal policy that we put in place during the pandemic, a fiscal policy that has led to high savings, low debt, a record unemployment rate, a record job creation rate, and a record small business creation rate. But as you know, and as my colleagues have talked about, we have inflation. Inflation from COVID, from labor, from stimulus issues, from supply chain issues, and yes, the war in Ukraine. But despite that, we are on solid footing, and the U.S. is resilient. We have cash and savings, our companies are bumper profits, our housing market remains hot, and our banks are strong. But there are vulnerabilities, especially when it comes to energy prices. And that's not just in the U.S., that's throughout the world, especially in Europe, as they wean themselves off Russian oil and gas. And in the United States, where we have a tidal wave, still a tidal wave of demand. When it comes to gas prices, Madam Secretary, isn't it true that the President has little power to control the price of gas? Domestic gas prices generally track global oil prices, although refining capacity globally is also very scarce, and the spreads between gas and especially diesel and um, crude oil are at very high levels, but these are global markets, and what happens here uh, generally does that. The president, of course, has had an historic release um, of a million barrels a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And, and in addition to that, Madam Secretary, isn't the president encouraging domestic production by encouraging them to use the existing leases for that production? Ab absolutely. And isn't the president encouraging our international partners to increase their production as well? Absolutely. And yes, uh, we're trying to do everything we can to stimulate production and high global oil prices are their own stimulus. That's how demand and supply work. And there, there certainly are incentives built into the market prices for domestic producers to increase supply. And there's also the long-term solutions of bolstering our productivity with our supply chains, with the investment of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as the Competes Act as well. However, Looking forward and looking to the issue that my colleague Ron Kind raised, at what point do we lower tariffs, especially Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum? I, I don't have anything to give you on that at the moment. That's we we have been looking at 301 tariffs, um, have not yet taken up the 232s. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I yield back. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Quiet. Chairman and Madam Secretary. Thank you for, for being here today. I want to, before I get to my question, I want to chime in on the conversation that you were having with my, with my friend from California, Mr. Panetta. Um, I think the president has a lot to do with, with energy costs here in America. Um, it's a promise that he has kept from the campaign trail to end fossil fuel production here, here in Amer America. And I think it's a little disingenuous to say that he's doing everything that he can and the administration is doing everything that they can to increase production. Look, you cut out leases on, in the Gulf of Mexico and in Alaska. Just because you have a lease, the, 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 um, the administration is slow walking permits for things like the, for the um, seismic testing, as, as an example. They're, they're slow walking the permits for, for new natural gas terminals. And quite candidly, all of the ESG requirements, everything that's, every signal that's been sent to the American energy producers has sent the signal that we are, we are cutting them off. So I think the president has a heck of a lot to do with where gas prices are right now, and I think he's fully committed to, drive, to, to continuing to go down this road. Now, let me change subjects. I heard yesterday in, the, um, in, the, uh, in your Senate Finance Committee that you said that the release of public infra, uh, uh, private data was, was, was illegal and you took it very seriously. I was glad to see, hear you say that in reference to the ProPublica um, uh, writings and, and the release of that data. 
Has the FBI acted on your referral that you're aware of? They've taken the referral as have the other enforcement agencies and um, I, I have not yet heard what the findings are that, th that they have. So, 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 but for you to say that this is a, something that you take very seriously and it's a major problem, um, have, you, have you been pushing into this? I mean, have you gotten information back on this? You know, I, I mean, it's been a year and the public doesn't know what, wh where this is. I mean, this is a pretty big deal and it's pretty, it, you know, sh shouldn't, shouldn't we as a committee at least be updated on where this, on it, where this it, is? It is a huge deal, but I have turned this over to independent investigative agencies and it would not be appropriate for me um, to push them to... Um, hurry their investigation or try to interfere with the timing will you, will of it. You make sure I am that as when, anxious when as you are to find out what happened. Um, I have asked, have asked when um, findings may be available. I don't have any. All I don't right, Madam have Secretary, if that, that, that's, a, that. that's a huge deal for, for all of us, and I, and I hope that you will stay committed to that. I am, let, I let me ask you this question. Um, and do, you know, something a little different. Do you think the administration or do you expect the administration to get involved and to work with the Department of Education to use taxpayer information to verify income information um, if they make over $150,000 specifically related to student loan provisions and student loan forgiveness? Do you think the administration, do, do you anticipate a point at which the IRS would be involved in, 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 in this topic? I've not yet been presented with that issue. I, I will have to look into it. I, I don't know what the status of that okay, is. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Yellen. Um, I introduced a bill this morning requiring the Treasury Department to report to Congress on the impact that recent U.S. tariff increases are having on inflation. You know, these tariffs were imposed by the Trump administration and have largely been retained by the Biden administration. And they include the Section 232 tariffs that some of my colleagues have already mentioned, Section 301 tariffs on um, a lot of products from China. And then there was also the expiration of GSP, which um, allows certain products from many low-income countries to enter the U.S. tariff-free. But when the program expired, tariffs went up on all of those products, too. Um, my bill would basically require Treasury to examine the inflationary impact of these tariff increases um, individually and in the aggregate. And I know I don't have to tell you this. You know that tariffs are the equivalent of a tax on American families and American businesses. And yet I think these 232 tariffs are, are kind of hard to justify on national security grounds, and they've definitely alienated our partners. And then when you look at the 301 tariffs, they've failed to change China's abusive trade practices, and they've actually just ended up hurting American households and companies. And I, I keep hearing that these tariffs gives us leverage over China, and that just to me feels at this point like a stale talking point and not really rooted in reality. Um, but in light of the high inflation in this country, I think the case for repealing or reducing these tariffs becomes even stronger. And um, you may be familiar, but the Peterson Institute estimates repeal could reduce inflation by 1.3%. And while it wouldn't solve the problem, it would be a meaningful step. And I think for American families and my constituents, every single dollar of price relief counts. So basically my questions for you, Secretary Yellen, are first, do you believe these tax increases contribute to inflation? And has your agency estimated the inflationary impact of these tariffs? And if you haven't, do you think the federal government should conduct this study just like outside economists have? You know, you don't need my bill to, pa um, to pass in order to take undertake that kind of study. You could do it right now and have the information for a way to address um, inflation uh, that is hurting so many American families. So um, we're currently reviewing our tariff policy, um, certainly with respect to China. And, you know, I think some reductions um, may be warranted, could help to bring down the prices of um, things that people buy that are um, burdensome. Uh, I, I want to make clear, I, I honestly don't think tariff policy um, is a panacea with respect to inflation. Um, goods account for only a third of consumption, and it's not clear exactly yeah, what I, the incidence I, I, I think, 
and pass with through all, would be. Right. But it's certainly, look, we inherit, China has been guilty, I believe, of many unfair trade practices. And we have reasons um, from national security in terms of supply chain resilience. We may have um, very good reasons to... When do you um, think you will be making some of these decisions? What's the timeline? Because our constituents are suffering from inflation and any little bit of help would matter greatly to them and they can't wait on us to drag our feet on this. The administration is looking at this now. Thank the gentlelady. Thank you, Mr. Let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Yellen, for joining us today. Uh, Secretary, you, you told Dr. Winstrup that uh, corporate tax revenues had decreased significantly since enactment of the GOP tax reform in uh, 2017, and that's, that's not consistent with the facts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to introduce for the record this report by the Tax Foundation which cites official CBO data. So ordered. You know, after the, tax, after the GOP tax reform in 2017, corporate tax revenues for the first half of fiscal year are already 20%, 22% higher than last year. And last year was already a record high in terms of tax receipts. So I just wanted to add on the record that, that actually the tax reform did result in higher tax receipts. Um, you know, it, it kind of seems a little bit, we've talked a lot about different things. Uh, today kind of seems like Groundhog Day from a year ago when, when Republicans talked a lot about inflation and the concerns and where we were going. And, and at that point in time, it was being called transitory. And now we're being told that it's, it's not the, the administration's fault. You know, I, I, I go back a little bit. Some of these things have already been mentioned, but, you know, there's a lot of economists, uh, including Democrats like, uh, uh, like uh, Larry Summers and, and Jason Furman, who, who um, were sounding alarm bells. Republicans on the committee were sounding alarm bells. Uh, you know, last year, I, I, uh, I'd like to enter several op-eds that, uh, that I entered last year, uh, one uh, from July 1st of 2021, an op-ed entitled Biden's Economic Crisis his wasteful spending will crush the recovery. Here's what we need to have to do. Uh, an August 6th, 2021 op-ed entitled, Fiscal Conservatism is Still the Best Way to Beat Inflation. And an October 6th, 2021 op-ed titled, Temporary Inflation is Still Here. Well, I'd like to end those record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, you know I, I, I've talked to folks in town halls uh, last year in, in October. 98% uh, of the respondents said they've seen a price increase uh, on regular necessities that they have. Uh, in January of this year, 62% of respondents in, in my district uh, to the, one of these surveys talked about rising prices, one of the most important issues facing our country. But it wasn't until May 10th of this year that President Biden said inflation was his top domestic priority. Why did it take you and President Biden so long to recognize this issue as, as an issue for American families and small businesses? Well, first of all, when President Biden was elected, um, the United States faced enormous challenges in terms of the pandemic and in terms of joblessness. And a critical priority was getting people back to work and making sure they had enough to eat and didn't lose the roofs over their heads. So there were a number of economic challenges, but if you had to rank them, I think the single most serious threat was a prolonged downturn in the economy that would have been a threat to family well-being. And from that perspective, the American Rescue Plan was hugely successful. We have a full employment economy now. After the financial crisis, it took a decade to regain full employment. There's no question, though, that inflation is too high now and um, that we need to address it. It has many causes. And when you see that countries all around the world and developed countries, UK has 9% inflation, Germany 8%, um, we're not the only country suffering from that. Um, I, I oil the prices gentleman. have risen. Um, it's, the president is doing everything that he can to address the, the challenge of high inflation. I'm sorry, I'm thank out of you, time. Matt. I have so many more questions. I'll yield thank back. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Estes, and thanks to the secretary. The gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, is recognized to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for your time here with this hearing. Um, 
As you are, I'm sure, aware, U.S. territories are on the European Union's list of non-cooperative jurisdiction for tax purposes. And with the EU's decision to analyze U.S. territories without the United States as a whole, this blacklisting is a matter of great concern because it's causing harm to Americans and U.S. companies that are in the U.S. territories. Moreover, the U.S. territories lack the ability to meet the requirements allowing to be removed from that list because, as you know, the U.S. Virgin Islands and others are sovereign territories of the United States. Uh, in the last administration, the Treasury Secretary, your predecessor, wrote to the Council of European Unions upon the initial blacklisting in 2017, finding that the United States disagrees with the Council's decision to consider U.S. territories separately from the United States and urging reconsideration of both the decision um, and the decision to include U.S. territories on the list. Does the position outlined in the letter of the previous Secretary of Treasury remain the position of the United States on the issue? The Office of Tax Policy is engaged with the EU on this issue, and we think that discussions so far have been productive. Um, we're optimistic that a, an agreeable solution to this issue can be found in that it's one that will be grounded on the unique status of the listed territories and the effects of their practical effects of their program. So we're very hopeful this can be resolved. Thank you. Um, maybe it's the former prosecutor in me, but I didn't really hear you respond as to whether or not you uh, are continuing to keep the position of the previous Secretary of Treasury uh, on that the U.S. territory should not be considered on this list. We did. We certainly agree. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate the continued uh, support of that. Keeping within that sector of the Caribbean, uh, you know, I've met with many of my congressional colleagues, uh, members of the Congressional Caribbean ca Caucus, about how Caribbean countries are treated by international finance institutions and the U.S. government. We're concerned that countries like Barbados and the Bahamas, where I recently visited, as well as Jamaica and others, have been cut off from access to capital and credit, given a de-risking mindset of overly cautious U.S. banks that have been encouraged in doing this, in part, by our own government. This de-risking has been unduly harmful consequences to the Caribbean. Um, and the region has long-standing historic, cultural, and economic ties to the United States, which has resulted in U.S. sanctioned trade preference programs and the Caribbean Basin having been supportive of American security operations. So I'm concerned and wonder, Madam Secretary, can you speak to the importance of the Caribbean region to the United States and what the Treasury Department is doing to address de-risking in the Caribbean, including the Department's progress on the strategy required by the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020? Well, I only have a few seconds, and I will just say, of course, the Caribbean is very important. We take this issue very seriously and are tracking what's happening with, um, with remittances, which fortunately have gone up. We think there are diverse drivers of de-risking, are concerned about it. One um, contributor is sometimes AML CFT mm -hmm. concerns, and um, realize it's important for foreign financial institutions to make sure that they mitigate those risks, and we would be glad to provide assistance. Thank the gentlelady. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Schmuckert, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You had mentioned the importance of reducing deficits and debt. We agree that that's important going forward. Is that right? Just confirming that. Well, agreeing uh, on, on deficits, it yes. was desirable to reduce. And I was, I was glad to hear that the president uh, seems to have come to that realization recently as well. Uh, I want to show you, though, I have a chart that sh shows the deficits on an annual basis. And you can see this is 2019. We have essentially two and a half years that were affected by COVID which we, we all allow for that. We know that the, expend, the spending was higher than, it was all deficit spending, by the way. But the year after COVID, the first year of the budget that we're here discussing today, 
is higher than the deficit was uh, before COVID hit. And then it goes up on an upward trajectory every single year uh, with one slight exception there uh, during this budget. How can you claim that you're reducing deficits or how can the Biden administration claim that deficits are being reduced in this 10-year budget? Well, it's, it's a reduction relative to what we inherited. Uh, so there's not a real reduction in the deficit? Well, obviously the baseline does have deficits rising, but proposals that we have made would. So we're, not, so we're not accomplishing the goal of reducing the deficit in any way in this budget? We have not proposed policies that would lead to greater deficits. And in the next 10-year uh, period... But, but we're leading to greater deficits in every year. Yeah. So, that, so that's, I, I call that swamp math. You go outside of the Beltway one step, and there is no one in America who will believe that the Biden administration is reducing deficits. It's harmful to the future of the country, and I don't understand how you can be claiming that deficits are being reduced when it obviously is not the case. Uh, I also want to talk about in the budget, there are, you know, let's put, put that away. There are um, multiple, uh, about 36 new taxes, taxes uh, proposed in the, in the budget. Uh, we again agree of the devastating impact uh, of inflation uh, on the people that I represent, people across the country. Do you believe that these tax increases, for instance, do you believe that raising the corporate tax rate will help lower the price of food or other household goods? Well, you just said that you think that deficits are important to reduce and the president's budget I didn't say, contains, I didn't, yeah, they are important to reduce, but do you- proposals that will help us do that. Well, we need to- And we need done in a way that's fair. We need to have growth policies that get us out. Do you agree with that? We need to have growth policies in place that will help to reduce the, the, the deficits going forward. The president does propose growth policies because um, we've invested in infrastructure. We need to invest in people. We but do you believe that raising the corporate tax rate will help lower the price of food? I do not think it will raise the price of food. Do you believe that raising taxes on fossil fuel production will lower the record high gas prices? Over the medium term, the way we lower them is to address climate change and to switch to renewables. Thank you. In the short so we term, have, we thank have a you, problem. Madam thank you, Madam Secretary. So the Secretary has about 10 minutes, and then we can get in these last three, Mr. Hearn, Ms. Miller, and Mr. Murphy, if we proceed to their questions quickly. Mr. Hearn. Madam Secretary, last week, uh, President Biden is quoted in his op-ed op by saying, quote, we should level the international taxation playing field so companies no longer have an incentive to shift jobs and profits overseas, end quote. Madam Secretary, does this mean you plan to withdraw the, uh, the foreign uh, tax credit regulations which punish Americans and encourage companies to offshore jobs and IP? I'm sorry, what, you're talking about the foreign tax credit regulations? Yes, ma'am. The foreign tax credit regulations are very important to make sure that, um, okay. that firms only receive tax credits when a foreign jurisdiction Okay, so we're just, primary. Madam Secretary, if I may reclaim my time, because this, this has been around 100 years, and all of a sudden, for the need of more tax dollars, we, we've, we've changed that, and you know this, and we've had a lot of conversations. Um, Last month, uh, Congressman Schneider and I, as you know, and he referenced, we sent you a letter outlining our concerns with the FTC credit regulations. And I appreciate your commitment from your team having a meeting with us to clarify the importance of the cost recovery and the royalty withholding portion of the FTC rules. However, it is my understanding that Treasury has no plans to change the rules dealing with withholding taxes on services, which will ultimately change U.S. multinationals' behavioral instinct to move jobs offshore. Madam Secretary, I know, I hope, anyway, that we want to take care of our American companies, our American jobs, and our American people. We want those good-paying jobs in our country. I want to work with you to ensure that those types of services won't be sent overseas while still accomplishing the shared goal of pushing back on discriminatory digital taxes. We agree on this. Will you commit to, to doing that, work on keeping our jobs here 
as opposed to allowing it to be offshore through some of the... Of, cor of course, and we will be happy to work with you on that. that. That was your commitment last year on June 17th when I asked you a similar question, but these FTC regulations are of great concerns. I would like to introduce a letter from 28 CFOs, our largest multinationals in this country that have grave concerns over this as well. I, I stepped away a minute ago to meet with one of these multinational CFOs that are outlining their concerns with this FTC regulations for the record. Mr. Chairman, may I so ordered. Thank you. Madam Secretary, I don't know how to ask this question other than ask this question like it is. Is it possible that you and the Treasury Department have gotten this wrong just as you, and I appreciate you admitting that you, you, mis, uh, you, you, you misstated the inflation issue last year, but is it possible that we're wrong on these FTCs? Are we willing to take the risk of seeing our multinationals export these great paying jobs overseas, IP in other countries? Is it possible you got that wrong as well? well we need to protect the American tax base and make sure that um, foreign credits or foreign tax credits are allocated when foreign countries have um, a, a taxing right but not when they don't. And um, we've objected to digital services taxes. We've found them to be unfair trade practices. M Madam Chair, I, Madam Secretary, I agree with you 100% on that, but completely eliminating them is not the way to go. Finally, I would say we can't pull out of these countries because China is happy to fulfill the role that we had there. And so, Madam, Madam Secretary, Thank I would ask gentlemen. that you work with us to, to get this right, because right now it's not right. I Thank appreciate you back. Let me recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to inquire. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Madam Secretary. By all appearances and actions, from the first day in office, President Biden and his administration have declared a war on American energy production. By canceling the Keystone Pipeline, by tying up the Mountain Valley Pipeline in my own state in endless legal challenges, denying export and drilling permits, and have attempted to appoint radical activists throughout the federal government to disincentivize or outlaw investment in oil, gas, or coal production. President Biden has even turned to foreign dictators for more oil, but won't enable us to drill more at home. With a simple yes or no answer, please, is it the goal of the Biden administration to make traditional forms of energy so expensive that Americans have no choice but to turn to the so-called green technologies? Over time, it's important to transition away from fossil fuels so to that's address a yes. climate change. Climate change is an existential threat and the president has proposed a comprehensive plan to promote the use of renewables and electric vehicles. And um, as a medium term issue, it's critical we address that. But obviously, gas prices are very high and we need to do um, work. It's not something we can accomplish in the short run. We do need Therefore. oil and gas production to address um, the energy needs Can of you Americans. Explain now. what the president's administration is doing to lower the price of gas at the pump, which is twice as expensive today as it was then when he took office, and the natural gas for our homes, which is three times more expensive than it was a year ago. These are global markets, mainly certainly for oil, although not for natural gas, and um, oil prices have risen globally most recently and dramatically because of Russia's war on Ukraine. And uh, Europe is committed to reducing its dependence on <coughs> Russian oil and promoting renewables in the process. And um, in the short term, the president has um, allowed an historic release of a million barrels a day from the strategic um, petroleum reserve to allow time for domestic producers okay. to respond to higher prices That's and enough. ramp up their production. Thank you so much, because I do respectfully disagree with part of what you say, if not most of it. You know, 
Our producers need a certainty that their investments can be made, and this administration's done nothing to promote a business-friendly environment. I also don't believe that we should be putting our national security at risk by tapping our reserves, especially when our domestic producers have the capability to supply our consumers with everything that they need. So I'm concerned with the administration is encouraging a windfall tax also on oil producers. In 1980, when President Carter did this, it was totally misguided and it reduced our domestic production by up at least 8% and made our reliance on foreign 13% higher. And we finally got rid of it in 1988. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Murphy, to Thank admire. you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. You understand, I'm sure, that this is Congress. This is the people's house. We go back to our districts and we actually talk to the people who are at the pump buying gas in the grocery store, as opposed to President Biden, who's been in D.C. for 50 years. There's been a common theme that uh, throughout his presidency of so many self-inflicted crises that he is tone deaf to what's going on to the American people. And I will point out two things that have been a little bit um, fallacious in the discussions here today. We talk about the uh, job growth and everything. The uh, unemployment rate prior to the epidemic in the Trump administration was the lowest it had been. During this pandemic, we fired people for not getting vaccinated. People came out of their jobs. All that's happening is people returning to jobs. We also know that during the great resignation, many people eliminated themselves from the workforce. So on one hand, people want to blame the pandemic for what's going on today, and other people want to take credit for what's going on today. We know for a fact that since Biden took office, the inflationary rate in this country rose, rose, rose. It was 7.9 percent the day prior to the Russian invasion. So to blame fuel prices and everything on the invasion of the Russian uh, dictator is absolutely incorrect. So I would ask you this, how then in the face of today's skyrocketing inflation, which we all agree is a regressive tax where we see fuel prices going through the roof, we're about to see food prices double, how can you say and justify that adding $4 trillion in taxes are good for the American people and the inflation that the average American, which Biden just doesn't understand, how can it be good for the American, average American? Well, especially given that gas prices, which are related to global oil prices, which we have only modest control over, can put in place some um, policies to affect it, but it is a global market and high food prices, which are also being affected by... Um, but how can these Ukraine. taxes, how can these yes, $4 trillion in taxes what, help what the American will, people? First of all, they will enable deficit reduction, which will complement the Federal Reserve's tighter monetary policy. And second of all, they'll enable the financing of... Uh, government programs that will help to bring down. So, it, as we tax people, we take expenses. more of their money away from them when they have less discretionary spending now because their real wages those, have actually those, decreased. Those proposed tax increases um, won't mean mean not a penny more spent by on taxes by any household making four hundred thousand dollars or less. They That's a lot of people. Entirely on very high income individuals and corporations that also should be paying their fair share. I understand. Thank you. Let me just finish up with one other question because corporations are mom and pop businesses. They're key people with sandwich shops, they, they are, they're people that run their own uh, grocery stores. Let me, let me follow, follow up one thing. Uh, the Biden administration now wants to try to plan to cancel so much of student debt, up to $1.3 trillion in student debt. This is, again, another regressive tax initiative because most of the individuals who would benefit from that are higher income earners. It's well documented, and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record um, one particular documented, document that canceling student debt will add to inflation. Do you believe that's a good idea? So ordered. Without objection, it is included in the record. No decisions have been made about student debt. Do you agree that it would add to the inflationary pressures of the country today? It depends today? on how it's done. I'm going to proceed now to conclude with Mr. Horsford in the next three and a half minutes. Mr. Horsford is recognized to inquire. Thank you for your indulgence, Chairman Neal, and thank you, Secretary Yellen. I didn't come to Congress to defend every federal program. Uh, there are federal programs that work and deliver for our constituents, uh, but there are other programs that 
do need to be reviewed and uh, improved. Uh, and my constituents didn't send me to Congress to uh, make political points in committee. Uh, they asked me to address critical issues that are affecting them, and the cost of living is one of those issues. Now, we're all aware of the impact that inflation is having on Americans. Some of this is related to global factors, such as Putin's war in Ukraine and the COVID-19 pandemic. But some of, it in, uh, some of this includes the inactions here in Congress. We have so much that we could have done and still can do to address the rising cost of living if we work together regardless of party. So I'm asking my Republican colleagues to work with us on this side of the aisle to lower costs on housing, childcare, food, and gas prices, to not make this about politics, but to work together to solve problems. Now, Secretary Yellen, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, the prices for homes in Nevada have reached record highs in recent months. In May, the median cost of an existing single-family home in Southern Nevada was $482,000, an increase of more than 25% from May of last year. At the same time, rents have risen almost 25%, ranking Las Vegas metro area number two in the nation for fastest rising rents. Now, one of the main reasons for this is because out-of-state out of corporate investors are buying up the limited housing stock in our communities. I recently had Secretary Fudge in my district just this Monday to tour some of these developments and to talk about the need for increased investment in affordable housing. Now, while I agree with the record amount of new jobs and increases in wages, my constituents do expect me to raise issues of concern, including housing and gas prices with you today. So my question is, what tools does the Treasury Department currently have to combat the predatory actions of corporate investors who are buying up homes and pricing out local residents? And what is Treasury doing right now, or do you intend to do, to help ease the price of gas? And what recommendations, if any, do you have for us here on the committee? Well, in terms of Treasury's powers, we've been very focused on the Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the Homeowners Assistance Fund that I think have been helpful in addressing the problems faced by especially low-income people in the middle of this pandemic. Um, affordable housing is a key goal of the administration. The Build Back Better package uh, contained uh, funds for affordable housing. Um, we certainly recognize that there was a huge problem before the pandemic and that with the escalation in house prices and rents, we're seeing that this is uh, a critically um, important need. And so we look forward to working with Congress uh, to do what we can to address this. I thank the gentleman, and I want to thank our witness for joining us today. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the Ways and Means Committee stands adjourned. <laughs>